convene the public hearing of October 14th, 2021 and call it this meeting is being convened by electronic means and as such, council members may participate in person or by electronic means. For council members who are participating electronically, please do ensure your video is turned on and let the clerk know if you leave the meeting for the purposes of confirming quorum. And I'll note this is especially important this evening as we are um, close to the wire on quorum and short of a number of councillors. If council members are attending by electronic means, do lose connection during any portion of the hearing, we will recess the meeting until the connection is restored. If council members lose connection during the voting process, staff will get you back online quickly while we suspend that voting process. The contact information has been circulated to you. Members of the public can view the proceedings via the live stream and YouTube link, which will be tweeted out by at Van City Clerk. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh na Nations. We thank them for having care for this land and look forward to continuing to work with them in partnership as we build this great city together. I also want to take a moment to recognize the immense contributions of the City of Vancouver staff who work very hard every day to help make our city an incredible place to live, work, and play. Clerk, can we have the roll call, please? Yes, Mayor Stewart is on leave of absence all day for his civic business. Councillor Carr. Here. Councillor DiGenova. I expect she might be late. Councillor Fry. Here. Councillor Swanson is absent. Councillor Hardwick. Present. Councillor Weeb. Present. Councillor Boyle. Present. <laughs> Councillor Dominato has a leave of absence for the evening. Councillor Bly is away. And Councillor Kirby Young is deputy mayor in the chair. The meeting has quorum. Great. Thank you, Clerk. And as you heard, we do have four council members absent for various leaves this evening. So again, we appreciate um, councillors maintaining quorum. Okay, before we begin, I do have some announcements. The public may participate by speaking in person, um, by phone, or by submitting written comments to Mayor and Council. All speakers will have five minutes to make your comments and should limit your comments to the merits of the report that is being considered. Speakers should also state whether you are in support or opposed to the recommendations and if you are a resident of Vancouver. Speakers may speak only once and should follow along on Twitter at Van City Clerk for updates on the progress of the meeting so you don't miss your turn to speak. And any comments on agenda items can be submitted in writing through our online web form at vancouver.ca slash public hyphen hearing hyphen comments. This link will also be tweeted. Those that are speaking on behalf of other persons or groups will have eight minutes to speak if, only if those represented are also present on the phone with you um, or in person and must not be speakers themselves. Speakers who have pre-registered with presentations are reminded that the public live feed does have a slight delay. To navigate through the slides of your presentation, please stay next so the clerk can help advance your slides. I also want to note the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including the utmost respect for all genders. I would remind Council that when addressing speakers and staff, we will avoid using gendered honorifics as is our practice, and will instead refer to the person by first and last name, role, or title. So a reminder that Council's role at a public hearing is to be a quasi-judicial body, which means that Council is to only consider the merits of the rezoning application or heritage designation. Council members may ask clarifying questions from speakers, including the applicant, or technical advice from staff, but should save debate for after the close of the speaker's list. And after hearing from speakers, Council may either one, approve the application in principle, two, refuse the application, or three, refer the application to staff for further consideration. And finally, if Council does not conclude from hearing all speakers this evening, although I'm going to put in a plug and hope we do, um, we will recess and reconvene the meeting on Tuesday, October 26, 2021 at 6 p.m. Okay, so our first item of business this evening is a rezoning for 328 360 West 2nd Avenue. And before we begin, do any members of Council wish to declare conflict of interest on item one? Okay, seeing none, I will ask the clerk to read the application now and the summary of correspondence that has been received. 
This is an application by 1057300 BC Limited to rezone 328360 West 2nd Avenue from L1 Light in, and Medium indus, in, intense, <laughs> Intensity Industrial District to L1C Light and Medium Intensity Industrial District to permit an industrial and com commercial development with a maximum floor space ratio of six and a maximum height of 152.5 feet. If rezoning is approved, a subsequent a subsequent development permit process will include a review of a proposed form of development. The general manager of planning, urban design and sustainability recommends approval subject to conditions set out in the summary and recommendation. The following correspondence has been received since referral to public hearing and prior to the close of the speaker's list in receipt of public comments. Six pieces of correspondence in support and two pieces of correspondence in opposition. This represents all correspondence received up to 345 today. Great, thank you very much, Clerk. So if there are any speakers for this item who do wish to speak to Council, please call now toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 884-37-POUND before the close of the speaker's list. The phone number will be tweeted out and made available on the live stream. And there will also be opportunity for those on the phone or in person to speak at the end of the registered speaker's list. So Council, we now have a uh, teen fan Senior Rezoning Planner, um, Urban Design and Sustain Sustainability, here to provide opening comments to the application and to see the presentation if that is Council's will. I do note that we don't have speakers tonight for this item at this point. Just one, just one moment, um, staff, if you could. Councillor Carr? Councillor Carr, do I have you on the queue? Did you have a question before we begin? I think she might be on mute, Chair. She may well be. She does. Councillor Carr, on you might want to check your mute if you can hear us. And if not, I'll just give you a moment to check that. And I'm just going to advance to Councillor Fry. Councillor Fry, did you have a question before we begin? Uh, I did have a question of staff, but if we're going to hear the presentation, I can wait till after the presentation. I wasn't sure we were going to hear okay. the presentation. Okay, I'm not hearing um, any desire to waive the presentation from council, so we'll go ahead and begin. Go ahead, staff. Chair, I'm, I'm not hearing staff. Perhaps it's just me? Uh, no, I think- On a uh, point of privilege. I thing. was just gonna say that, thanks, Council Did you know that I think that um, perhaps speaking closer to the mic might help. Thanks, thanks for that. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Teen Fan, Senior Rezoning Planner, and I'm joined by Kevin Spand, Senior Development Planner. This is the very first application coming in front of council uh, for the recently approved rezoning policy for the I1C zone this past January. This new policy permits intensification of job space with increased height and density along 2nd Avenue in the Mount Pleasant industrial area. The site currently shown in red is on the southwest corner of 2nd and Alberta Street on the northern edge of the Mount Pleasant Industrial Area, also known as the MPIA. The existing zoning is I-1, and there's currently a two-story building with industrial and commercial businesses currently on site. The remainder of the MPIA, which is highlighted in purple, is primarily industrial with varied building heights and some moving up to 11 stories. To the north is the mixed-use Southeast False Creek area, allowing buildings to go up to 16 stories. A number of amenities are within the vicinity, including a number of parks, the seawall, childcare facilities, and two community centers. The site is very well served by transit with two nearby SkyTrain stations and bus and cycling routes. The MPIA is also shown in purple here, 
and it's designated for industrial use under the Metro Vancouver Regional Growth Strategy. Since the 1940s, the area has emerged as a unique employment space, supporting a diverse economy with light industrial and commercial uses. Currently, um, there are two images of upcoming projects shown here on, for the Mount Pleasant Industrial Area, giving Council a sense of the buildings um, going up in and around the area. Industrial uses include production, distribution, and repair activities, accounting for one-third of the total floor area currently. Limited commercial uses are permitted, such as office and retail, in order to emphasize the importance of this area for a mix of uses for job space. The Broadway planning process and the employment lands review identified this location as a key opportunity to deliver intensified industrial and office space close to transit. As such, in, in January, Council adopted the Mount Pleasant Employment Intensive Light Industrial Rezoning Policy and Guidelines, also known as the I1C Rezoning Policy. The intention of the I1C Rezoning Policy is to unlock the economic potential of the area by increasing job space close to transit. These policy changes have the potential to deliver some 3,500 new jobs for the area. Similar to the Canby Corridor townhouse rezonings that enable a simplified rezoning process to a district schedule, sites within the I1C rezoning area can also develop to a specific and a predictable I1C zone and not to a customized CB1 zone. This I1C zone contains an established height, density, and use, shown here. Uh, shown on the right, we have uh, the existing zoning, which is I1. And in purple, you can see that 2FSR is permitted for office, service, and retail, um, provided that 1FSR is provided for light industrial for a total of 3FSR, noting that 1FSR has to be industrial. Flipping to the next slide, uh, the rezoning to an I1C effectively doubles the allowable density to a total of six FSR and simultaneously doubles the required industrial uses to a minimum of two FSR. The remaining four FSR can be commercial. Please note that industrial is still required. And building heights can simultaneously increase from 60 feet to 152 and a half feet or about 11 stories. This new I1C zone is a standard zone and it focuses specifically on land use changes. As such, detailed architectural drawings are not required at the rezoning stage and applicants can then move more quickly to a development permit process after public hearing. The rezoning application today is for light industrial and commercial building at 2nd and Alberta. Per the I1C zone, the total FSR is six two of which will contain light industrial on the first two floors and the remaining is commercial above. The building height is 152 and a half feet or approximately 11 stories. The uses, height and the density all align with the I1C policy. The project could generate some 70 construction jobs and from application to public hearing is seven months representing a much more streamlined approach. While architectural drawings are only required at the development permit stage, the policy comes with very clear design guidelines to ensure that buildings are to be respectful of their context. Examples of building typologies are shown for Council's information below. Building forms are to consider setbacks, public realm improvements, sunlight onto spaces, especially for the north sidewalk of 2nd Avenue, and, and buildings um, spaced adequately between each other. Uh, light industrial is expected on the ground floor with compatible service and office use above for a synergy of uses. The public consultation for this application was, uh, sorry, the public feedback for this application was quite minimal. We received three comments supporting additional density and commercial opportunities for the area. And the remaining three comments were concerns about impacts on property values and the increase in traffic. This application is expected to generate some two and a half million dollars in public benefits, including a commercial linkage contribution. This linkage contribution is to be allocated to childcare and affordable housing per the CAC policy. 
Development cost levy and public art contribution are also expected through this rezoning. The application's height, density, and land uses are absolutely consistent with the I1C rezoning policy, and the proposal would deliver new industrial and office space to support the city's economic objectives. Staff support the application and are available for questions, and the applicant team is also here for questions tonight. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, we do have um, the applicant here to um, present, so um, is the applicant team wishing to uh, speak to the application this evening? Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is Ryan Duff. I'm the Senior Development Manager from Strand Developments. I'm joined by Cameron Thorne and Mark McCaw, the VP of uh, Development here at Strand. And we're pleased to be here tonight to put uh, before Council the first proposed site for the I1C zoning de designation here in Mount Pleasant. Strand is a local family-owned developer with more than 40 years experience with deep roots and long-standing commitment to the Metro Vancouver region. Since 1976, Strand has acquired, developed and financed thoughtfully designed residential and mixed-use projects throughout Vancouver and North America. While Strand has historically maintained a relatively low profile, we've worked hard in our neighbourhoods to establish a good reputation for being a conscientious partner to the communities that we're building. We acknowledge the leadership of council and the tireless work from city staff to bring forth the new I1C district schedule and the associated rezoning policy and the guidelines. We agree that this policy will create new employment opportunities throughout Mount Pleasant and also revitalize the West 2nd Avenue streetscape. We're excited to contribute to these efforts by being the first applicant to put before council our, uh, our site itself for the I1C zoning designation. We thank Mayor and Council for their consideration in this application, and we look forward to contributing to an exciting and uh, growing Mount Pleasant neighborhood. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Okay, Council, this is an opportunity uh, to ask any questions um, that you have to staff or to the applicant, and just noting um, that this is the only opportunity to ask questions of the applicant at this time. Councillor Fry, I have you up first. Go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Uh, this is a question for staff. Uh, following up on on when we had um, <clears throat> approved these quick starts for the new I one uh, C uh, zoning, we had amended uh, with unanimous support of council. Uh, adding a consideration for arts and culture spaces as public amenities um, to be included in the uh, commercial linkages or CACs. I'm wondering why we're not seeing that in this uh, report. Hi, Councillor Fry. It's Teen here from uh, Rezoning, Senior Rezoning Planner. Yep, thank you for that question. Uh, certainly remembering the January public hearing and that amendment. I believe that amendment was really related to looking at developing a... Um, further opportunities in the Broadway planning program through the public benefit strategy that is underway through that planning process. And I believe that council is expected to receive information about that Broadway planning program in Q1 of 2022. So I think that those considerations of adding uh, the opportunity for artist space through uh, linkage contribution, I think is, is part of that work currently being done. So you're saying the staff did not interpret that as being specific to the, the I-1C? Because that certainly was my impression that we were applying it to. Uh, thanks, Councillor Fry. Um, our reading of it was that it was part of work that would be underway through the larger uh, Broadway planning program that would include the Mount Pleasant industrial area. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I don't believe that was the intention, but I'll, I'll, I guess I'll take that away as... Um, as, as how you've interpreted it, and we'll have to follow up, I suppose, some other mechanism. Not really sure how that works, Thank but thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's all, Councillor Fry. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It is for now. I'm just going to 
pull up the minutes and try and wrap my head around this a little okay. bit. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Hardwick. There we go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure if it's to staff, but what is the role of Cushman and Wakefield in this uh, development? Good evening, Councillor Hardwick, it's Teen, uh, Senior Rezoning Planner. To my knowledge, we haven't come across Cushman and Wakefield through this specific rezoning. I just wondered, because we just received three letters of support from people that all work for that company, so I wondered if that had uh, any bearing on it. Um, interesting, thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, seeing no further questions from Council at this time, uh, we'll proceed okay, to hear from- sorry, Cabrera, Can I get on the list? Sorry, I'm having trouble with my X. Yeah, absolutely. Just go ahead, Councillor Reed. Um, yeah, follow up to Councillor Fries, recognizing that when we were voting, we were looking at different opportunities to increase the funding um, for the connection. I'm just wondering, do we feel that the land value capture in this current project is going to be enough to pay for the increased amenities and um, service roads and utilities that will need it to service this project? Councillor Reeb, it's uh, Teen here, Senior Rezoning Planner. Yep, we, we look to the CAC policy, um, and that CAC policy establishes a uh, 1052 square foot per increase in floor area for sites that are proposing commercial industrial. So I think that from um, applying Council's CAC policy to this application, we do believe that that definitely um, comes forward with an opportunity to fund growth in and around the area. Noting that it is a it is a, a leasehold project; it's not a strata project. So we would look to the CAC policy. Okay, and then do we see affordable housing and childcare being able to be delivered in the near area? Do we have projects that we see um, on the horizon so we can point when the community looks at the increased development in this area where that will be delivered? Yep, uh, certainly, yeah, we've, we've actually secured, through the com commercial linkage contribution we've secured since 2017, some $30 million. Um, and we've collected through rezonings uh, that have been enacted about $10 million. And to my understanding, a large portion of that has gone towards childcare. So we definitely see that being recognized. Also a site at five West 2nd is also an opportunity to deliver some affordable housing in and around the area. So that's one perfect example. Perfect, thank you very much, appreciate it. Great, thank you, Councillor Weeb. Okay, uh, so seeing no other questions from Council at this time, we will now hear from the public. Uh, just a note, we do not have registered speakers, but if there are any um, members of the public who do wish to speak to the item before Council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 88437-POUND. Um, before we close the list. Uh, and again, this number is tweeted out and made available on the live stream. And any speakers that might be present at City Hall can come forward to the podium. Clerk, do we have any speakers on the line? No speakers. Okay. So uh, we'll move on then. Um, hearing and having none registered. Um, to calling three times for any additional speakers. Can we do that now? Yep. Um, so doing the first call for speakers, uh, if there are any additional speakers for this item, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 88437-POUND. Um, before the list is closed, the phone number is tweeted out at Van City Clerk and available on the live stream. And any speakers present in person can come forward. That is my first call. Okay. When I do a second call for any speakers that wish to call in, please do so at 1 353 8610, followed by participant code 88437 pound. Before the list is closed, the phone number once again is available on Twitter at Van City Clerk and on the live stream. my second call. Okay, and third and final call for speakers uh, would be to the same number, one 353 8610 
followed by participant code 88437 pound. Um, before the final call before the list is closed. Number available on Twitter, Van City Clerk, and on the live stream. And I'm not seeing any members of the public present in the council chamber. Deputy Mayor, um, I'm hearing that there could be speakers downstairs. So if we could, um, perhaps if I could suggest a three minute recess to allow them to come upstairs. Okay, I do see activity, someone out there. Um, okay, it is six council and Republic at 6.32 p.m. So we'll recess and reconvene at 6.35. Okay, everybody, we are reconvening after the recess, and if I can ask the clerk to affirm if there are any more speakers or not at this point. No speakers. No speakers, okay. Um, so hearing none, and having made three calls, we will now close the speakers list. And seeing as no few or no public comments were received on this item after 5 p.m. today, um, we will now move on to hearing closing comments asking further questions of staff um, and to make a decision. So does the applicant have any closing comments? Nope. Uh, does staff have any closing comments? No closing comments, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, did council have any questions for staff? Councillor, did you know where you have the floor? Thanks very much. I did have a question for staff. I was wondering if staff might be able to comment on uh, a, a comment that was made before about a uh, number of CACs being allocated to daycare. 
um, and, and wondering how much of that daycare space has in fact been delivered and what the timeline is for that in the CACs that have been collected for that. Thanks for the question, Councillor DiGenova, Team Fan, Senior Rezoning Planner. We do understand that uh, 10 million has been uh, collected through enactment, and a portion of that is going to the, the new Coal Harbor School with a daycare. Okay, can, can I ask um, if, if you're not sure how much of that um, is, is going to, to the Coal Harbor School with the daycare, then my follow-up question would be, how much is remaining from that 10 million that is still to be spent and what does it look like? Like what, how far out are we looking for that, that uh, those funds to be allocated to childcare projects? Hi, Councillor DiGenova. Actually, we do have that information. Um, about $7.8 million is going to the Coal Harbor childcare and about 600,000 has been allocated to the Henry Hudson School and about 1.7 million to the Gastown Parkades. So that totals of roughly 10 million of the 28 um, that's been secured. Okay, um, I may have some follow-up questions on where the remaining $18 million are, are going, but I won't ask that here. So thank you very much for that, that very detailed insight. That's all, Councillor Tichinova. That's uh, that's all from me right now. I'd be happy to. Oh, I see Councillor Cardwick is on the queue. I was going to move the motion, but I'll take myself off. Great, thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Go ahead. Thanks. I have two questions. The first is um, once this property is rezoned, it will be uh, reassessed to highest and best use. What is the increased in, uh, increase in assessed value from the current assessment to the uh, projected assessment once the rezoning has been approved? Hi, Councillor Hardwick, team, uh, senior rezoning planner. That information we don't have at this moment. So you don't know how many more times over the value of this property is going to increase or inflate after the rezoning is completed? No, we don't have that information tonight, Councillor Hardwick. Sorry. Wow. Um, can you uh, tell me if you have, and this is a larger issue in this in this area, considered um, the cost of of the industrial use that is provided relative to the existing costs to uh, the kinds of companies that would be using this light industrial uh, property. Just uh, saying that a different way. Um, have you looked at the cost of the existing rents or leases on this property versus what the cost would be of the space uh, once the new building is in place? Uh, thanks, thanks, Councillor Hardwick. We don't know the existing um, costs, uh, the existing rents of the existing leases. The applicant, of course, might have that information. Um, but what I could tell you is that we don't, we couldn't also necessarily project into the future, recognizing that if council approves this public hearing, this rezoning tonight at public hearing, um, when, when the applicant comes forward to build and start to tenant and start to lease the space, um, you know, that timeline is up to them. So it would be really hard to predict um, the comparison for a future date. My point is, of course, if we're going to displace existing industrial use, anticipating that we're going to uh, increase industrial use and we don't know those numbers, that uh, is uh, very tricky since we have already identified that we have um, a sh uh, declining and shortening uh, industrial base of land to start with. So we don't know what the inflationary cost is going to be on assessment, and we don't know whether the um, light industrial uh, ca capacity that's going to be created would be affordable to local businesses. Um, are we concerned at all uh, in interpreting light industrial as office space that uh, in light of the changing nature of work that uh, we that uh, there might not again, be the kind of demand that we would want that might uh, displace existing light industrial use in favor of, of potential office uses. 
Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Um, we don't anticipate there would be a displacement of light industrial. We anticipate a doubling of that in light industrial use. Um, and only, a, only if that light industrial use is provided can one gain the opportunity to add office. I might move that also to, over to my uh, colleague, Sean Martinez, who might be able to speak a little bit more about uh, some of your questions. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Sean Martinez, Planner in Citywide and Regional Planning, uh, Economic Development uh, Planning Team. Um, what I could say is that we do know that vacancies uh, within the industrial uh, base are very, very tight. We're seeing historically low vacancies um, below 1%. Uh, while that has been happening, we've also seen that over the last five years, uh, there have been dramatic increases in the rent um, that industrial industrial spaces are paying. Um, we've seen 62% increases uh, just on the asking rent over the last five years as the vacancies have tightened quite a lot. Um, we've engaged with uh, a large number of, um, of industrial users in the city. And for them, it is the, the supply is so tight that for any price, they can't find space. Um, we're looking at I1C and this doubling to provide more space um, for for industrial, uh, and, uh, and and that would then provide more choice uh, for these users. Thank you very much. I know I'm over time. Appreciate the answer. Would love to have more conversation, but I know this isn't the time or the place. But thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Councillor Dijanova. myself back on the queue. I was just prepared to move the recommendations by staff. Okay, thank you. Uh, moved by Councillor DiGenova. Do we have a seconder? Second, Councillor Carr. Oh, seconded by Councillor Carr. Um, is there any debate, Council? Councillor Fry, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm uh, I'm not going to get a, get in the way of this rezoning, but I am uh, disappointed by the interpretation of the amendment that we had provided on this specific uh, rezoning schedule um, back in January of 2021. I think the interpretation is quite rigid, and um, I just want to highlight that that this is certainly not the expectation uh, around this, and recognizing that we are, in fact, in this IC or this one IC district. We are seeing a loss of a lot of maker and creative spaces, and the intention of that specific amendment was to address that. And I know we have a lot of things that are coming out ahead of the Broadway plan, uh, despite the Broadway plan having been on the books and we're, us being expecting it for some time now. Uh, we've yet to see the Broadway plan materialize, but we're certainly seeing uh, spot rezonings coming ahead in the absence of the Broadway plan. So I'm, I'm not really happy with the idea that this is proceeding. Uh, and and not recognizing that very specific amendment that came forward that was not exclusive to the Broadway plan, the fact it references it and the Broadway plan. Um, so I, I, I want staff to hear loud and clear in the planning department that, that that was the intention, and I believe that was the intention of all of council when we moved this forward specifically on the rescheduling for this district. And, um, and, and I hope that we see a little bit more thoughtful um, application of that direction in future amendments because I know that or sorry future rezonings in this area and not waiting on the Broadway plan that may or may not materialize in a timely manner. So I'll support this but I'm I'm not really happy with not seeing this amendment recognized. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Uh Councillor Hardwick, closing comments. Yeah, my mood is uh, very much along the lines of, of Councillor Fry's on this and I would amplify this it's like, we'll go along with it, but not happy about it. Uh, moreover, I, I am concerned about uh, erosion of our remaining industrial land and into a situation where we're continuing to inflate land values and increase the costs. So um, it's making it ironically uh, less affordable to new businesses in light industrial kinds of activities. and. Um, as someone that had in, in the years when I worked in the film industry, we worked a lot in this space and it's all gone and it's not going to come back because it's the bottom couple of floors of, of what is an, essentially an office building with a couple of floors that have been made into, uh, you know, presumably light, uh, light industrial use. So, um, I'm just concerned that we might be biting off our nose to spite our face, uh, metaphorically, um, 
but uh, back to uh, echoing Councillor Fry's remarks, I'll go along with it, but not happy about it. Okay, thank you, Councillor. I'm not seeing any other councillors on the queue for any closing comments or remarks, so I will ask the clerk to. Yeah, sorry, I can't. Oh. Can I get on the list? You just can, just, un the just under the wire, Councillor Weep. Sorry, I'll try to remember your you difficulties. There you go. Go All ahead. Right. Text on, text on it, I should be really quickly here. Um, I as well, I think that there's an opportunity here lost. I, I think that this is a really critical arts and culture area. I think there's a lot of great businesses. Don't in do space. it that way. That's not how the CACs work. I think someone might not be on mute, Chair. Yes, pardon, sorry. sorry. Pardon me, just a point of privilege. Let's, let's go ahead, start again, Councillor Weep. Oh. Sorry, can we, um, maybe we can just get the clerk to check for a moment. Just, just hold on a second, Councillor Weep. Okay, let's uh, let's try and proceed again. Go, go ahead, Councillor Weep. I'll stop. I start start your timer again. Yeah, I think that there's been a lot of development, which is great to see that we are increasing our industrial space and job space in the region. I do in the area. I do see that when we did talk about it um, back in the Mount Pixel component of Mount Pleasant industrial area um, and only child care being the contribution. There is other needs and different amenities that would be useful to continue in this neighborhood. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can find a way um, to look at what other opportunities we have as we increase this area to ensure that we continue to have the artist space um, and do what we can to keep the vibrancy of this great industrial area. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Weeb. Um, I do understand that we may have had a small bit of confusion with respect to whether we had a speaker available earlier. So I'm gonna ask for Council's grace to ensure that we are, since we are in a quasi-judicial process following protocols appropriately. Um, and I'm just gonna take a two minute recess so that we can tee that up. That'll be the most efficient. So we'll be back at 6.50 p.m., thanks.
opportunity for those on the phone or in person to speak at the end of the registered speakers list. So we now have Joseph Tohill, rezoning planner from Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability here to present the application. Uh, if council so chooses, I will note for council, we do not have any registered speakers for this item. Okay, I'm not, not hearing any desire to move wait. it. Sorry, um, Councilor Carr here. I move to waive their presentation. Okay, we have a move to waive. Uh, is there Second. anybody? Oh, well, is there anybody, I'll ask it this way, is there anybody that would like to see the presentation? Okay. I'll second waiving the You're, presentation. Thank you, Councilor DeJove. I don't think we need a second there. It's just, we just need to note if there's any opposition. And I'm not hearing any opposition. Um, so we'll move on. Um, is the applicant team here? Um, and would they like to speak to the application? Deputy Mayor and Council, I'm Barry Savage representing Transca Development. I have with me Daniel Eisenberg, our architect, our landscape architect, Julian Patterson, and Dan Roberts, our sustainability consultant. We're here to answer any questions you have. Thanks for your time this evening. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Council, are there any questions either to staff or to the applicant and noting that this is the one opportunity to ask questions of the applicant? Councillor Carr? Do I have you on the list for questions? Uh, no. No, okay, that was a holdover. Okay. Councillor Weeb, you have the floor. Yeah, my first question is, are there staff, the applicant, is recognizing these transit stops, um, we have seen the ability to build over top of them and utilize that space. Can we talk about what is our policy on utilization of space near transit stops and how we interface a building like this with transit stops in the future. And I guess to the applicant, it talks about two, two towers that went down to one. If you wanna talk about that process on why you went down to one tower. Sure, I'll let uh, Daniel Eisenberg, our architect, uh, go through the design process that we went through to go from two towers to one. Um, hi, this is Daniel Eisenberg. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Um, the reason we deviated from the, from the two tower scheme um, in the plan is we proposed a daycare on the roof of level five. Um, in order to have provide enough open space for this daycare outdoor area, um, we sort of shifted from the two tower configuration to a single tower that allowed uh, lots of open space for that daycare. That's one of the main main reasons. Uh, also, efficiency uh, was improved that way. Okay, and Dan, do you want to talk about your interaction with the transit stop and how you, what architectural tools you use to incorporate that as part of the building? The transit station uh, is not part of the development currently. Um, we okay. have been, sorry. We have been mindful on, on the transition to the station in terms of how we treat the public realm at the transition, but the station is not part of our application. Yeah, no, it's just the transition. Okay, thank you very much. Is that it, Councillor Reeve? It sounded like you had a question around policy earlier to staff. I guess, I guess the transit stop is currently owned by the province, is that correct? Because I'm just looking at the ability to utilize the space above some of the transit stops. So does staff want to talk about how those decisions are made when looking at a project like this that needed space on the top? Was there an opportunity to look at utilizing some of the spatial elements above the transit stop? I believe that's a question for um, for planning. Is it, yeah. For staff. 
I mean, recognizing that we're about to build a whole bunch of new sorry, transit stops. Sorry, Councillor Weeb is at time, so I apologize for that. But yes, um, if I can ask staff maybe to speak a bit closer to the mic, I think that might that might be helpful. Um, I'm going to advance Councillor Hardwick now. Councillor Weeb, sorry about that. Councillor Hardwick. Thanks. You might want to reset my timer. Um, because I'm showing 652. Yes, I am as but well. My question is um, similar to one I posed on the last application, is what is the current assessed value of this property and what will the, um, the anticipated assessed value of the property be after the rezoning? Thanks for your question, uh, Councillor. Uh, we don't have that information available. So we don't know how much land inflation is attributable to this project? Uh, correct. Okay, suggest so that's something that we might know. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Are there any, seeing no other questions from Council at this point? Uh, we will now proceed to hear from the public. Uh, so once again, if there are any speakers for the item who wish to speak to Council, please call toll free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 884-37-POUND before close of the speakers list. Phone number will be tweeted out and made available on the live stream. Any speakers in council chambers can, should come forward to the podium. Clerk, do we have any speakers on the line? No. Okay. Um, having no registered speakers and seeing, hearing none on the line, I will now proceed to make three calls, three final calls for additional speakers. First call, if there are any additional speakers to the item, Call toll free 1 833 353 8610, followed by participant code 884 37 pound um, before close of the speaker's list. Phone number is available at Van City Clerk and on the live stream. Any speakers in the council chamber should come forward. That's my first call. Second call for speakers. Once again, speakers should call toll free 1 833 353-8610, followed by participant code 88437-POUND before close of the speakers list. The phone number is available at Van City Clerk and on the live stream, and speakers at City Hall should come forward to the podium. That's my second call. Okay, third and final call. The number to call in is 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 88437-POUND before closing Final closing of the list. Phone number is available on Twitter and on the live stream. And I'm not seeing any speakers present here at City Hall. Clerk, can I just verify that we have not received any speakers? Currently none, but I'm being told to just, there might be somebody trying to get on the line. Chair Kirby Young, if perhaps we could have a short recess to allow the speakers time. It looks like there's a possibility. Okay, sure. As has been our custom, we will take a five minute recess to verify if any calls have been received and we will return at 7.09 p.m. Thank you.
Okay, everybody, uh, we're recon recommencing. Um, Clerk can ask you to verify that we do not have any speakers on the line. Yes, Chair um, Kirby Young, I can confirm no persons on the line and no in-person speakers. Great, thank you very much. So moving uh, on, as no few or no public comments were received on this item after 5 p.m. today, I suggest we now close the receipt of public comments and move on to hearing closing comments, asking further questions of staff and to make a decision. So at this point, does the applicant have any closing comments? No comments from us, thank you. Thank you. And do staff have any closing comments? No further comments. No comments? Okay, thank you. Okay, so council, we will now make a decision on the application. Do we have a mover for the motion? For the recommendation? So moved. Councillor Boyle. Okay, moved by Councillor Boyle. Do we have a seconder? Second. Second by Councillor Weave. Seeing no... Oh, I see one councillor on the queue for closing comments. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Yeah, thanks. Um, so what we're really talking about here is uh, 128 strata titled residential units. Um, and I couldn't get the answer to the question, how much will the assessment, assessed value of this property increase as a result of this rezoning? And again, it is uh, the level of rezoning that has been so persistent, which while it may be a generating revenue for us in the form of CACs, is also uh, leading to exponential land inflation in the city and exacerbating the affordability problem. This is something that we need to get a handle on. And um, this is why I've continued to uh, emphasize this and, and try to focus on obtaining the, the requisite data so that we can be making the appropriate policies going forward. Uh, so I, again, will feel compelled uh, to vote in opposition to this application as I, uh, and I am hoping that in the future when I ask the question about how we expect that land inflation will be affected, um, at least through the assessed value, which is something that can be defined by BC assessment and highest and best use. So we'll understand the impact that we're having on in land inflation in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Weave, closing comments? Yeah, um, I will be speaking in favor. Um, I appreciate the conversation with the developer on how they limited to one building to increase the sunlight. I appreciate the fact that there is a significant amount of extra trees on the new property, um, as well as finding a way to create large child care spaces. This is great transit oriented development. Um, I think it's important to have these type of amenities this close to transit, um, as well as the YMCA and other great amenities in the area. So I will be supportive. Great, perfect. Thank you, Councillor Weave. Uh, seeing no uh, comments from any fr other councillors at this point, I'm going to ask the clerk to take us to a vote. I'm yes, to Councillor Digenova, do you need a vote assist? I do. I'm having some trouble with my cue. So if I could have a vote assist in favor, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thank you. That has passed with one in opposition, Councillor Hardwick. And that concludes item two, CD1 rezoning. Take a moment, just let staff get settled for the next item. Oops. Anybody that uh, is participating electronically may not be on mute. We are hearing some background noise. I just want to check that. Okay. 
I think we're ready to go. So we're moving on to item three on this evening's agenda, which is CD1 rezoning 4575 Granville Street. And before we begin, does any member of council wish to declare a conflict of interest on item three? Okay, seeing none. Um, I will now ask the clerk to read the application and the summary of correspondence received. This is an application by Stuart Howard Architects Incorporated to rezone 4575 Randall Street from RS5 Residential District to CD1 Comprehensive Develop Development District to permit the development of a four-story residential building containing 24 secure market rental units. A height of 39 feet and a floor space ratio of 1.23 are recommended. The General Manager of Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability recommends approval subject to the conditions set out in the summary and recommendation. The following correspondence has been received since referral to public hearing. 56 pieces of correspondence in support and 13 pieces of correspondence in opposition. This represents all correspondence received to 345 today. Great, thank you very much. Okay, um, if there are any members of the public that wish to speak to this item and speak to council, please call toll free one 833 353-8610 followed by participant code 88437-POUND before the close of the speaker's list. The phone number will be tweeted out and made available on the live stream and there will be an opportunity for those on the phone or in person to speak at the end of the registered speaker's list. So we now have Chi Chan, Rezoning Planner, Urban Design and Sustainability here to present the application. Please go ahead. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'm just gonna share my screen. Just waiting to see if it, okay. All right. Good evening, uh, Deputy Mayor and Council. My name is Chi Chan, rezoning planner for this application, which proposes to rezone 4575 Granville Street under the Affordable Housing Choices Interim Rezoning Policy. So the subject site, shown in red, is located on Granville Street, one lot south of Connaught Drive. The site and surrounding uh, areas are zoned RS5 residential and generally developed with detached houses. The lot to the south, 4615 Granville Street, is currently developed as an eight-bed hospice facility operated by the Vancouver Hospice Society. The site is approximately 1,600 square meters in size. There is a rear lane behind the lot which connects to Connaught Drive to the north and West 32nd Avenue to the south. A 10-foot dedication is provided along Granville Street for public realm purposes. There are no tenants on this site. Here is a map of local amenities. Uh, the site is located in the Shaughnessy neighborhood. There are several parks, child care centers, and local schools within a 10 to 20 minute walk of the site. The site is located on the number 10 Granville Street Frequent Transit Service. There are also several designated bike routes uh, one to four blocks away from the site. It's located within the catchments of Shaughnessy Elementary and Prince of Wales Secondary Schools. According to VSB's uh, Long Range Facilities Plan, Shaughnessy Elementary is operating at capacity while there is current and future capacity at the Prince of Wales Secondary. VSB manages uh, capacity by limiting out of catchment enrollments and placing students in nearby schools, recognizing that while the local elementary school is at capacity, there is capacity overall in the system and in nearby schools. The Housing Vancouver strategy sets a target of 20,000 new market rental housing units across the city to help address Vancouver's historically low vacancy rates. This rezoning application is being considered under the Affordable Housing Choices Interim Rezoning Policy, which was approved in 2012. In November 2019, Council approved the Secured Rental Policy, which consolidates opportunities for rezoning contained in the AHC and Rental 100 policies. While the AHC policy was closed to new rezoning inquiries after June 2019, applications received up to this date can continue to be assessed. This inquiry for this rezoning application was received in June 2019, just prior to the deadline. The intent of the AHC policy is to enable real examples of more affordable housing types. 
rezoning applications under the policy must meet a number of criteria, including compliance with location requirements. The HC policy allows for a maximum of two projects within 10 blocks along an arterial. At this time, one other HC application has been approved within 10 blocks along Granville Street. On June 25, 2019, Council refused a rezoning application for this site for rental townhouses. After hearing the comments by the public and Council at the public hearing, the applicant submitted a new rezoning inquiry on June the 28th, 2019. Following the inquiry submission, the applicant continued to refine their proposal, notably through facilitated discussions with the hospice, which led to the design that you see here and submitted a full rezoning application on December 16th, 2020. I will compare the changes in a subsequent slide. The current application proposes to rezone the site from RS5 to CD1 to permit the development of a four-story residential building containing 24 secured market rental units. There are 12 one-bedroom and 12 three-bedroom units. The, recommend the recommended density is 1.23 FSR and the height is 11.9 meters. As part of the Restart Smart Vancouver initiative in response to COVID-19, uh, this project will contribute approximately 84 new on-site and off-site construction jobs during the initiative's recovery phase. This slide shows a comparison between the previous 2018 application and the current one. Based on Council's feedback and direction to the applicant at the previous public hearing, the applicant focused their consultations with the hospice through a series of facilitated discussions, the applicant revised the two building scheme into one. This allows for larger 20 to 30 foot side yard setbacks for greater separation, privacy and landscape screening compared with the 10 foot side yard setbacks previously proposed. The applicant also reduced the number of parking spaces to the minimum required to meet the parking bylaw, 17, in order to reduce the amount of excavation and construction and also allow landscaping to grow on soil. Top floor balconies are also screened with privacy screens and planters. The design was developed through a facilitated dialogue between the applicant and the hospice at the start of 2020 until application submission. After the submission, the developer continued to work with the hospice to draw up a good neighbor agreement to address the construction and operation related impacts of the proposed development. Both parties have informed staff that they would conclude the GNA, good neighbor agreement, following council's decision on this application. The applicant is eligible to seek the DCL waiver for this application and will make that decision at the DP stage. This slide has been included to show the applicant's proposed average unit size in the gray columns and the average market rents for newer buildings on the west side in the blue columns, which could be anticipated. Information about the costs of home ownership are shown in red. They assume a down payment of 10% and they range approximately from 62,000 for one bedroom to about 154,000 for a three bedroom. No pre-application uh, no pre consult, uh, no pre-application open house was pr held prior to application submission. As previously noted, the applicant focused their pre-application consultations with the hospice. Following the submission of the rezoning application, a city hosted virtual open house was held from February to March of this year. Approximately 297 notification postcards were mailed out to local area residents, alerting them to the virtual open house. In total, we received approximately 221 pieces of feedback. We heard comments both in support and concern about the project's height and density. We heard comments of concern about the privacy, noise, traffic, and construction impacts from the proposal on the neighboring hospice. And we heard concerns that the development will not provide adequately affordable housing. To address privacy, 30 foot setbacks, significant landscape screening and screening on, top of the, on the top floor balconies are included in the proposal. Recognizing that construction, any construction will have impacts on the surrounding neighbors, the good neighbor agreement between the developer and the hospice intends to set up clear communications protocols and measures to mitigate, the construction, uh, to mitigate construction timing and impacts. The city's noise control bylaw also regulates and limits construction related noise for private development. Staff reviewed the proposal and conclude that the proposed four-story height and density are appropriate and consistent with similar townhouse buildings on arterials across the city and are compatible with the lower-scaled neighbors. 
on affordable housing, the measures of affordability provided under the AHC policy is for secured market rental in comparison with home ownership. The AHC policy does not require below market rates. In summary, staff recommend approval of this application to rezone 4575 Granville Street from RS5 to CD1, subject to the conditions in Appendix B of the report, as it does meet the intent of the AHC policy. If approved, the application would contribute 24 new secured market rental units. Thank you very much for listening. Staff and the applicant teams are available to take your questions. Great, thank you very much, staff. Um, we will now proceed to hear from the applicant. And is the applicant team here to speak to the application? Um, would it be possible for the uh, clerk to put up uh, our submission? So, Council, I'm just noting that since we have the applicant in chambers, uh, the clerks are advising me that they cannot display the presentation on WebEx. So if Council would like to follow along, um, it's recommended that you do that on the public live stream so that you can see the, uh, the pre same presentation that is being shown in chambers. Okay? Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, Councillors. My name is Neil Robertson. I'm the project architect for this project. Um, I would like to begin by thanking Mr. Chan and city staff for your excellent presentation and uh, thank you council for once again taking the time to review our project. Since our last time before you on this project over two years ago, we've been working with our client, city staff and in consultation with a neighboring hospice to reshape our design. In our last public hearing, we heard several concerns from council. We heard uh, concern regarding unnecessarily high number of parking on site um, tied with concerns regarding the impacts associated with the resultant size of excavation. We heard concern regarding the proximity of the proposed development to Granville Street and its impacts on hedging. And finally, and most importantly, we heard concerns related to the impact of the proposed development on, on the adjacent hospice in the south. In regards to the first concern, as Mr. Chen uh, explained, we've reduced the number of parking on site to the minimum required under the Vancouver Parking Bylaw which is of course significantly reduced the amount of excavation required. In regards to the second concern, we've pulled the project back away from Granville Street, allowing for more breathing room to the street, while also affording sufficient room for hedging to be provided. The majority of our time, however, has been, sent, uh, has been spent collaborating with the hospice. Our client engaged a third party facilitator to work with the hospice representatives and ourselves to create a framework for resolution. On their side of things, the hospice enlisted the assistance of former director planning, Ray Spaxman, as well as former city planner, Scott Hine, to assist. We held several fruitful conferences to understand each other's positions and concerns. Um, once we felt that we adequately understood the design objectives, our office prepared three drastically different approaches to redesign the proposal. We, pre we presented our three massing alternatives to the hospice group and asked them which of the three schematic designs best addressed their concerns. We met with them and discussed the pros and cons associated with each proposal. When they decided on an option, on an option that you see before you today, we completed the redesign, submitted it to city staff as a formal resubmission and began working with city staff. At the same time, we began working on a good neighbor agreement with the hospice representatives. Through several months of collaboration, we have an agreement, we have agreement from both sides on a draft good neighbor agreement, which addresses issues ranging from finished design to pro protocols during construction through and beyond final occupancy. A key component of this agreement, of this agreement is the design of the landscape between the two properties. Should council choose to support our proposal, we look forward to developing the landscape design through the development permit process in collaboration with the hospice representatives and completing the good neighbor agreement. 
this has been a very long and challenging process for all people involved. I wanted to end by, by thanking city staff for all of their hard work and all the hospice representatives, especially their new executive director, Mrs. Sarah Kopp, for coming to the table in a meaningful and genuinely collaborative fashion. I understand the concerns remain, but we look forward to continuing to work with them to address these concerns. The development team, including our third party facilitator, are available uh, should council have any further questions to the proposal and, uh, uh, or our process and design. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Okay, I will note that um, this is an opportunity for um, councillors to ask questions of either staff or the applicant, and it is the only opportunity to ask questions of the applicant. Councillor Dijanova, go ahead. Could you reset my clock, please? Yeah, we seem to be having a bit of difficulty with the clock tonight. So, Clerk, can I ask if you can reset that? Thank you. There you go, thanks. Um, my first question is for the applicant. I'm, I'm trying to look back to your previous application to council and compare the, the for, just for my own understanding, the prices um, that, that would be charged in the rents per month. I see the very comprehensive um, data that you've provided here and it's in the referral report, but can you tell me, is this less affordable than it would have been had council supported the project? Um, in your last application, just because we are talking about the same land, and it was mentioned uh, by staff in the referral report, as well as in the presentation this evening about the previous application and the good neighbor agreement. So I'd like to ask um, how much uh, of, a, of a, I suppose, how much of the affordability has been lost, or in fact, um, how much affordability has been added to the site in this new application? Um, thank, thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, I, 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 I'm af afraid I'm a little ill-prepared to talk about the economics of this project. Uh, Can I just ask you to speak a bit closer? Oh, to your I'm, I apologize. That's thank fine. you, Councillor, uh, for your question. And unfortunately, I, I'm afraid I'm a bit, bit ill-prepared to talk about economics uh, of the project. Um, I, I, you know, I can say that I know cost of constructions have def definitely increased over the last two years. Um, how that affects the actual bottom line and, and the affordability of the rents, I, I, I'm afraid I, I, I would be just guessing at this date. Um, perhaps okay. perhaps I, I, Mr. Chan might uh, ha have the numbers. Okay, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I suppose I'm also asking because of the DCL waiver that you may apply for, would this impact um, whether or not you applied for the DCL labor or wa sorry waiver to deepen uh, the affordability costs? Um, well, well, yes. I mean, the DCL waiver uh, typically is not decided at a later stage, the development permit stage. Um, I think we have our, our clients would have to uh, make an assessment at that time. Um, you know, uh, it, it will be several months before we, we, we can prepare a development permit application set, and at that they would run the performance at that time. And I, and I think it, at the end of the day, it's, it's just a dollars and cents thing. Um, if, 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 they can, if they can do the below market rates, I'm, I know our clients would be, would be thrilled to do so. It just depends on whether the economics uh, permit that or not. Thank you so much. That's a very comprehensive answer. And what I was wondering is, do the economics factor into that? So to deepen affordability, that may be a reason that uh, the application moves forward requesting the DCL waiver. Is that correct? That would be correct, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. I uh, really appreciate that. I actually have uh, a question now for staff. If that's okay, Chair? Yes, absolutely, go ahead. Thanks so much. I uh, just wanted to, to understand in the good neighbor agreement with the hospice, um, and this application and understanding the history here that's been outlined and noted um, in previous documents as, as also for the presentation this evening. Um, are, is this gonna require good neighbor agreements with other properties in the future? Um, I'm wondering because I am basing it on this property and wondering what this property is be or this application is being held to and if other applications within a, a certain radius are being held to the, the same standards around hospices. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor, for the question. 
Uh, there are no city policies that would require good neighbor agreements to be to be struck. But in this case, based on the feedback that the applicant and developer heard uh, at council uh, at the last public hearing and, and from the public and from the hospice, uh, they have chosen to undertake a good neighbor agreement in this case. Okay. So this is a choice that they've taken. Otherwise, they'd be free to apply without the good neighbor agreement. Uh, uh, as I said, they, uh, in our discussions, they clearly had listened to what council had directed them to do previously, and, and they've gone on and undertaken that at their, uh, at their initiative. Thanks very much. I'd just like to move for a second round of questions in case I don't have enough time, Chair. Sure, do we have a seconder? Uh, seconded, Boyle. Seconded by Councillor Weave. Uh, any in opposition? Oh, okay, so we'll have a second round. Do you want to use your last few seconds, Councillor DeGenova, or come back? I'll ask my. I'll ask my one question in uh, my last few seconds, and that would be: Is it still applicable to build a thirteen thousand square foot home on this property? And perhaps staff can answer that um, when I come back on the queue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor DeGenova. Councillor Hardwick, you have the floor. Thanks, and I'd actually uh, commend the applicant for um, sticking this out and working with the hospice and their advisors most commendable uh, because there was the suggestion this would just be uh, developed as a mansion site so very encouraged to see that this is is happened um, my question the applicant is in regard to the good neighbor agreement and, and getting that in place what's the timeline to complete that you said it's in draft form Thank you for your question, uh, Councillor. Um, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, a really key piece of, the, of this good neighbor agreement is the curation of the landscape barrier between the hospice and, and our project. Um, so in terms of timeline, it, I, I don't want to put pressure on the hospice and saying we, we have to have a decision on this landscape. Um, but as part of our development permit application, our goal is to have it uh, sewn up at, at application stage. Um, but uh, as I said, it, it, it's, it's a very complex piece of, of, of the project and it's the landscape that really is the, really the hold up on the execution of the good neighbor agreement at this time, which is dealt at with that development permit application. That's close enough. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Councillor DeGenova, I know you've had one round, so if it's okay, I'm going to advance Councillor Carr for her first oh, round. Oh, of course. I was just afraid I'd miss it. Yeah, no Sorry. problem. Maybe you can put yourself back on the queue. Councillor Carr, go ahead. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, and also um, very commendable around the process that ensued. I have one question really uh, for the applicant around that process that ensued um, in this round um, in the uh, reapplication. And that is... Um, regarding the facilitated discussions with um, in, uh, ex city planners Scott Hine and Ray Spaxman, who initiated that? I mean, I'm curious if, if it was a staff suggestion, if it was the hospice, if it was was you as the applicant. Um, thank you for your count, uh, qu question, Councillor. Um, it was after the uh, council turned down our previous agreement, we uh, sort of licked our wounds a little bit and, and went and talked to um, with our client and, and we convinced them that they shouldn't throw in the towel, that they should, uh, there was a path forward here. And then we examined ways of path forward. We did discuss with, with city staff um, what their opinion uh, was on it. Um, I, I, I can't say it was one specific person's. It was sort of discussions and, and consensus of how we could um, address council's concerns, address the neighbors' concerns, and what were the best best way forward on that was. And uh, the, the the I, c I can't remember who suggested it, but it, but the idea was put forward of of, of using a third party facilitator. Um, unfortunately, City of Vancouver does not have uh, a list of facilities, but uh, but other jurisdictions do. And I was familiar with some of the some of these lists from other jurisdictions from other projects. And um, we I actually use the the district of North Vancouver uh, list of third party facilitators, and uh, and it's been a very very uh, uh, fruitful pr uh, process. I do have to say. Well, so our former city planners 
or on the North Vancouver's list. That's very interesting. Good information, and thanks for sharing that. Um, that's all about my questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to, Councillor Fry, I'm going to let you go because you haven't had a round yet. And uh, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, a question for the applicant. I was just, it took me a minute to dig up that old application. And, and I note that, um, that the amount of parking has halved since the application that we had in 2019. Uh, you had 32 parking spots uh, versus 17 in this iteration. How are you making, I, I totally appreciate it because that was generally the direction that this council gave as far as the scope and scale of the excavation and how it impact the hospice. How have you physically made that work as far as parking requirements for residents? What, what changed? Thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, we, well, the, the simple answer is that, that we were over providing on parking before. Um, in the previous application, when we met with a lot of the, a lot of the stakeholders in the neighborhood, we kept on hearing over and over again, more parking, more parking, more parking. Um, but uh, once we heard the concerns with the, from the hospice, more, most specifically, and, and from, from council, um, uh, we didn't need to overprovide that um, in in tandem with using a traffic demand uh, TDM. Um, we are able to get the parking down to the numbers that you see today. That's 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 fantastic, and I, I do really appreciate that sort of level of responsiveness from from you and the applicant. So uh, that's great. Thanks. Great. That's all, Councillor Fry. Yeah, that's all. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Councillor Dijova. Go ahead. Thanks. I tried to, to fit my question in before, but I'm wondering if this application were not to go through, if staff could remind us what, in fact, could be built on the site or what other applications could come forward. Is it still for a 13,000 square foot mansion? And, and could you confirm, have construction costs gone up significantly in the past two years? And will that affect the affordability um, in your assessment of this pro forma? from the previous application. Uh, thank you, Councillor, for the question. So to answer your first question, uh, the, the site is currently zoned RS5 and uh, they could do whatever is permitted under the RS5 zoning, single or duplex, with a uh, approximately 12 to 13,000 square foot home um, based on the, the FSR permitted under RS5. Uh, to the second portion of your question, um, no pro forma was evaluated as part of this application. According to the city's uh, policy, uh, it's not required to for lower density secured market rental projects. Uh, I'm speculating a little bit, but I have heard anecdotally, yes, construction costs have, come, have gone up, but how that has affected the applicant and the developer's pro forma, I don't have that information. Okay, thanks so much. And just to follow up to that, I would assume the pro forma would be assessed at um, and if such a time as the applicant were to move forward in this process and apply for a DCL waiver, is that correct? Uh, so thank you for the qu question again. Uh, as, part of our, as part of our rezoning processes, uh, lower density secured market rental buildings don't under, typically under five stories within uh, under five stories in an RS zone are not required to submit a pro forma for uh, review. And that's because uh, the finance department, real estate, they've looked at many applications across the city and just found there's this kind of threshold uh, below which uh, it, when you, when it's the, the, the benefit or the, the, the lift is driven into securing that market rental. And so there is no, there is no uh, additional lift and therefore, the, the, C, the city CAC policy says, you know, if you're under this height in an RS zone, we don't need to see it. We're pretty sure. We're pretty sure there is no lift. Okay, even if you're applying for a DCL waiver. The DCL waiver, the restrictions on the DCL waiver come in terms of uh, starting rents and unit sizes, and and same thing through that financial analysis, they found that there, there's not likely to be a lift, and we don't require a CAC. Uh, we don't require pro forma evaluation. Sorry, I, I should say that you would look overall to make sure that that complied with the DCL policy, which would have to comply with certain parameters instead of a pro forma, but it would have to comply with certain parameters to meet the DCL waiver. Correct. correct? Should the applicant apply for a DCL waiver, yes, they would be required to, um, you know, secure the starting rents and, and unit sizes. Okay. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate the answers to my questions. Great. Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Um, not seeing anybody else in the queue. I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a question myself of the applicant. Um, and, and that really um, is noting that in the, as you referenced in the original application, there were 21 uh, townhouse rental units, and now we have 24. And I just wonder if you can speak to whether um, is it, that's achieved through the one building form or if there's a differential in size of units, or if you can sort of comment on that. Uh, thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, it's certainly the geometry uh, pl played a helping hand in that, and also the the unit makeup. Um, before, uh, sorry, to, to the unit, unit makeup. Before, when we had the front and rear block, um, we had to hang buildings up over the, the drive aisle um, entry uh, on the rear block. So we lost a lot of, of, of buildable space in, in that respect, and we were sort of having to keep it um, pulled off the lane to provide adequate uh, rear yard space for this unit. By turning the geometry 90 degrees to that, um, not only did it give us the huge side yard setback to the hospice side that you see before you, but it was also a slightly more efficient uh, layout uh, with respect to, because I was able to tuck the ramp just beside the building instead of having to have the building hang up over top of the parking garage entry. Okay, and does that, you said also the composition of units, is there much change in terms of the configuration? I know it's a half or family units or in the size of the units? Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to recall the, the last unit makeup. Uh, we do have, I think, 50% family, family uh, townhouses in this one, over 50% one-bedroom garden units in, in this, this layout you see here before you. Okay, but no... Approximately the same. But. No um, significant differential in size between the units? No, no, they're all approximately the same. There's okay. certain ratios and geometries that just, I think just sort of work with townhouses. So. Okay, so a net increase three additional rental units. Yes, it did, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council, seeing no further questions um, from Council at this time, uh, we will now move to hear from the public. And if there are any speakers for this item who do wish to speak to Council, please do call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 88437-POUND. Before the close of the speaker's list, this number will be tweeted out at Van City Clerk and made available on the live stream. Any speakers in the council chamber um, should come forward to the podium. Now, we do have registered speakers for this item this evening, and I'll ask the clerk to confirm if we have our first speaker on the line. Yes, we do have the speakers on the line. I believe speaker number one is available. Great, thank you. So speaker number one, Molly Kavanaugh, are you on the line? Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you for speaking to council. You have five minutes to make your point, so please go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, mayor and council. My name is Molly Kavanaugh, and I'm a resident in Vancouver. I'd like to offer my support for the project at 4575 Granville Street. Professionally, I work as a teacher at a nearby local elementary school. You might be surprised to hear that the demographic of children at this school is far more diverse than what you might expect noting that it is located in a particularly affluent neighborhood. Working here has really reaffirmed my belief that the kind of diversity seen at this school is really something that we should strive for everywhere. The reason that this school in particular sees such a breadth of backgrounds is due to, being, to, due to it being a spillover school. So many kids are traveling in from outside this catchment every day. Not to mention, seeing as kids from other neighborhoods are coming to this school, clearly there is additional capacity in this area. Regardless, if it weren't for this, I doubt, for the, I doubt that these kids would get to have such a rich and vibrant experience with their classmates. This proposal is exactly what this neighborhood needs and a step in the right direction for encouraging diversity in all areas of Vancouver, not just the traditionally more affordable ones. Obviously, we are in a housing crisis, when I was getting my education degree, I remember our teachers telling us that getting a job as a teacher in Vancouver is no problem. It's finding jobs as teachers in the suburbs that proves difficult. This was directly due to unaffordability and, to be honest, lack of availability of housing here, especially on the west side. If approved, we would see 24 secured rental townhomes that can house teachers like me and families like the kids that I teach. I really encourage you to support this application and reward developers for listening to community feedback and refining their submission. Thank you. 
Great, thank you so much. Your points were clear. You don't have any questions from council, but we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, speaker number two, Sandeep Dhaliwal. Uh, hi, um, good evening, mayor and council. My name is Sandeep Dhaliwal, and I'm calling today in support of uh, 4575 Granville Street. Um, I spoke to you in 2019, and uh, needless to say, I was disappointed at the time, but I'm uh, excited for the potential approval today. Um, I'm a young, uh, I'm a father of young kids, and I I'm motivated because um, I see an option for them in the future to to secure rental long-term housing. Um, I, I don't want them faced with the same challenges young people have to deal with today, trying to secure safe and, and affordable rent to pursue their dreams and live in Vancouver. Um, it's also apparent to me since, since originally speaking to you guys in, in 2019 and, and council is that um, certain neighborhoods in our city also bear a unshare fare of their rental housing stock um, and neighborhoods like Shaughnessy are kind of re left relatively untouched. Um, and it's kind of a shame because they're, they're, there's a massive opportunity to prevent single family homes and, and one taxpayer unit um, versus multiple units, multiple families generating multiple incomes and, and helping our city build even bigger because our city has a lot more problems to sort out than figure out if we should build a mansion on a big lot or, or build more houses on a lot so more people can live in the city. Um, I just think it's a, a great opportunity um, and um, I really do commend the the architects and the builders and, and everyone that's not given up and, and taken it through the steps to get to this point where um, tonight, hopefully with your approval, um, we can see this project move forward and create those dreams as realities for those 24 families that could potentially be living here. Um, that's really all I have to say today, Mayor and Council. Thank you for your time and um, thank you. Thank you so much for speaking to Council. Thank you. Okay, speaker number three, Leslie Bolt. Hi, thank, thanks so much. Um, thank you to Mayor and Council um, for the opportunity to speak today and I'm, I'm calling to support the proposed rezoning for 4575 Granville Street. Um, I was supportive of this project uh, in its previous iteration, but I'm really impressed with uh, the improvements that the proponent has made, uh, working with the hospice next door and, and, and making adjustments uh, to the project that I think uh, will benefit the entire neighborhood. I think this location is ideal for more density and echoing comments made by the two previous speakers. Um, the neighborhood can handle this additional density. It's got great transit service, as you know, on Granville Street, um, and secure rental is an important uh, component for the future of, um, of, of for families in, in Vancouver. Um, projects like this are not gonna solve the housing crisis, and not by a long shot, but um, additional rental in a neighborhood like uh, Shaughnessy, I live about nine blocks away from the, where this project will be built, um, are gonna be such an asset for the neighborhood. And I really urge uh, Mayor and Council to support the project today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thank, you do not have any questions from Council, but thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker four, Jason Gurm. Hello, thank you. Uh, good evening, Deputy Mayor and uh, Council. My name is Jason uh, Gurm, and I'm calling you tonight uh, to share my support for the rental housing project here. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a young professional who recently got married and moved to Vancouver from, from Mission, and we are expecting our first child here very soon. Um, I will say that I'm in support of bringing more suitable rental housing to this part of Vancouver. I think this is exactly what we need more of, and I think this is the perfect and uh, most logical location for it. I also see myself and my family moving into a, a project like this. Uh, I would love to own, but given the out-of-reach housing prices, 
we as a family are starting to believe more and more that rental may be the way to go, at least for the medium term for uh, for my family. Also, I have a financing background and I work for a bank. Uh, I would like to state to the council that the difficulty of founding, finding affordable housing is one thing, but the ones that are fortunate to find a home to qualify for a mortgage is another major issue, right? Uh, just to put it in perspective for council, a mortgage borrower who needs, um, who has $200,000 worth of household income with a $250,000 down payment may qualify for a $1.25 million home. We can probably all agree on two things here. The $200,000 household income is more than the, the average in, in Vancouver outside of probably this affluent neighborhood. And two, you're not going to find an adequate living space for $1.25 million in that particular neighborhood, right? Um, more so to agree with all the uh, good, great points all the speakers prior to me had, um, I would like to just see more rental housing in all communities across Vancouver so families like myself and others um, can live and work in the city. Uh, I won't take too much more time of your, your guys. I think you guys are going to have a late night. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, uh, for me to speak to you tonight and in favor of this project. I hope uh, you will vote in favor uh, moving forward for this project at this time. Great. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you for taking the time to speak to Council. Okay, speaker number five, Sarah Cobb. Looks like we have an in-person speaker, so we'll just give them a minute to set up. Hi, thank you. Great. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks. So my name is Sarah Cobb. I'm the executive director of the Vancouver Hospice Society, and I'm also a resident of Vancouver. So as many of you know, Vancouver Hospice Society is an eight-bed publicly funded hospice that provides care to around 150 individuals and many more when you include their friends and family every year. We're a critical piece of the healthcare system and we run at full capacity most of the time. When our beds are inaccessible, it contributes to increased congestion in our acute care system, which we all know is overstretched as it is. The community built Vancouver Hospice Society from the ground up for the people of Vancouver to have access to much needed quality end of life care. As you know, this is the second time this proposal is before council having been previously voted down. The hospice went to a tremendous effort to be a part of this process, having not been engaged in the initial proposal. The lack of stakeholder engagement forced us to advocate for ourselves and mobilize the incredible community of hospice supporters who understand the significance of the hospice care that we provide to the citizens of Vancouver. It's important for me to acknowledge that hard work uh, on behalf of the hospice patients and staff from our volunteers and supporters in defeating the initial proposal. Of course, the hospice would prefer that there be no development uh, near the hospice, given that this is a healthcare facility and the quiet nature of the space contributes to the patient's overall well-being and the experience of their end of life. When we started this process the second time, um, the initial designs were not significantly improved, but to the proponent's credit, we have met over the last year and the proposal before you has addressed some of our biggest concerns. As they've mentioned, uh, the complete redesign of the building and the significant setbacks, which allow for much more privacy for the hospice, the commitment to use alternative construction methods where possible to minimize the disruption and noise, uh, the significantly less excavation, which was gonna reduce the noise and allow for privacy enhancing mature landscaping to be planted across our property line. And as has been mentioned, the draft good neighbor agreement that the developer acknowledges our key concerns and lays out associated mitigation plan as well as communication plan for ongoing coordination and escalation of unanticipated issues. Ensuring access and operations of the hospice be maintained is critical to us, including the respectful removal of bodies and access for family, friends, including elders and those with mobility issues. We did this work on our own with little guidance and took the initiative to find a solution. We see this as a good example of how community can and should work with developers to improve design and local planning in consideration of the unique community surroundings. 
Should you approve this tonight, we would expect ongoing conversations to refine our good neighbor agreement to our mutual satisfaction and have it be a part of the development application submission. We're here at the table, and if this is approved, we sincerely hope the proponents will stay at the table too. This work has come as, at a significant cost to the hospice, and we hope that ongoing, going forward, we'll continue to collaborate in a respectful manner and work together to commit to ongoing, clear, and transparent communications. However, as a small organization, we don't have the resources to hold the proponent accountable if construction begins. If this becomes prolonged or disruptive to our operations, we need a focal point of accountability from the city. This is critical in keeping our doors open and continuing to provide essential end-of-life care. We believe that this year we've demonstrated the value of community contributing to this process and the work between the hospice and the proponent is what you see before you here today. What we do is important, and our goal is to preserve and protect everyone's right for a peaceful death. Given the improvements I cited, we have become supportive, subject to ongoing resolution detailed and aspects of the Good Neighbor Agreement, and a commitment to thoughtfully implement this. We hope not to be surprised by any adverse aspects that resurface later in the approval process, and would ask that staff kindly monitor on our behalf. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. And before you um, head out, you do have questions from a couple of councillors, if you're willing to take those. Sure. Great, uh, and first on the queue is Councillor Carr. Go ahead. Thanks, um, thanks so much. Maybe you could reset my timer. Sorry, I just noticed that it was at starting at two minutes. Yes, there's um, something funky going on with timers. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much, Chair. Um, so thanks so much for coming to speak. I, my, I guess my first question is, were you personally involved as the um, executive director in the actual process of facilitated discussion with the applicant? Uh, this time around, yeah, I was. Okay, and um, would you mind just describing how that, I mean, there were two facilitators. Was that, was, was that a, a lot of time and energy on your part? Um, You've come to some conclusion that's that's satisfactory, but um, how how would you describe that process in terms of uh, you know a good process? Mm -hmm. I think so. We had just one facilitator that was uh, hired by the proponent, and then at one point Ray Spaxman was working with us, and he handed over to to Scott Hine. So um, just to make that clear, you know, it was it did take a significant uh, amount of time from the hospice, especially uh, in my first year on the job and, and during a pandemic, but it was a productive process and we did feel that we were being heard. Um, and, you know, like I said, no development next to hospice is better, uh, but given the circumstances, uh, we, we feel satisfied um, with the collaboration that's taken place. Great. Uh, that's that's good to hear. Um, and there were a couple of issues um, that I remember at the first applica application that I didn't hear spoken about this time. I'm wondering if you might be able to comment on them. There were concerns last time around the oversight um, of your back area, um, especially um, where there might be some ceremonies or family gatherings that are particularly meaningful, where privacy is, is very important. Are you satisfied that the setbacks um, now and the screening are satisfactory to ensure your privacy there? I mean, I think we've done significant work on that. I think the setbacks are meaningful, the privacy screens are meaningful, and I think, it, as has been mentioned, we're hoping for ongoing conversation engagement on what the landscaping looked like to further uh -huh. improve that. Um, and if, you know, yeah, any way in which we can make that better for us is, is what we're looking to do uh, mm -hmm. to preserve that, that space and that, that, that dignity and that time for people. Right, okay, that's, that's uh, of course understandable. Mm -hmm. um, the other issue that I remember being quite controversial last time was around uh, the parkade entrance and the concern regarding the volume and the movement of, of, um, of cars down the alley, which you use as an access. And so can you just let me know how you feel about um, uh, whether or not that's being resolved to your satisfaction? 
We haven't specifically spoken about that this time around, to be honest, um, but I think the significant reduction in parking spaces is probably going to impact that and reduce that to some extent. Um, but other than that, to be honest, we, we haven't addressed that directly. Okay, yeah, it's it's half the number for sure. Okay, that's great. Those are my questions. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us tonight. Thank you, and for, the, for your good work in the community. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you, Councillor Carr. And you do also have questions from Councillor Hardwick. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Thank, thank you very much. I also reset my timer. Um, you mentioned something, I think you said a focal point for accountability in your remarks. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. I mean, I think Could the, you, oh, you want me to speak more to that? Yeah, I was, yeah, I, I was wondering what you were getting at with that and, and how that's something that we might be able to monitor. You know, I think at the end of the day, like once construction starts, we just, you know, I can't be running a hospice and running out the, to the street to, to try and manage like noise mitigation, et cetera. So I think what we need is somebody that we can call to help us to enforce some of these agreements and arrangements that we've made so that um, we're not on our own uh, trying to make that work, if, if that makes sense. Well, that, that, that does make sense. And so uh, in anticipation of final questions to staff, maybe staff could could be thinking about that. Um, I think this is a good example of working with the community to come up with a satisfactory solution. Um, would you say that it's has gone as well as you would could expect knowing that uh, you'd prefer to have no construction, but was there a sea change, I guess, in the way that you found working with the applicant? You know, I personally wasn't a part of the initial process, um, but I think that had this engagement happened the first time around, you know, it may have been a better outcome the first time. So all I can say is that it's important to engage the community and, and we're happy that, that they did so this time. Thank you very much for answering my questions. Thank you. Great, thanks Councilor Hardwick and thank you, Sarah. You have no further questions. Thank you for thank taking Thank you time. very much. Okay, speaker number six, Joshua Hayes. Hi, dear mayor and council, my name is Josh Hayes, and Thanks. I would like to and voice my before, support. For just before you begin, sorry, Joshua, um, I'm just gonna ask sure. the clerk to keep an eye on and manage the timers because I can't do them from up here. Sure. Okay, great. Sorry, go ahead, you have five minutes to speak to council. Oh, thank you. Dear mayor and council, my name is Josh Hayes, and I would like to voice my support for the market rental proposal before you tonight at 4575 Granville Street. I've lived in Vancouver for several years and I'm very aware of the troubles that come with trying to find long-term rental housing that's appropriate for families. I've been following this application for a while now and I was delighted to hear that it was moving forward once again. I can appreciate the character of Shaughnessy and its sprawling mansions, but I believe there is also a great opportunity to house our city's families and renters in this neighborhood as well. The property is well located near transit, schools, and many services that families rely on. By voting in favor of this proposal, Council will make an exciting choice to allow 24 beautiful new homes to be built in the lovely residential area. Not only is this proposal a step in the right direction for families and renters, it is also the sustainable choice for this community. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. You do have uh, questions from Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Hardwick, sure. go ahead. Sorry, that's a holdover from la the last question. Oh, okay. So uh, no Thank questions. You. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. No questions for you, Joshua. Thank you for speaking to Council. Thank you. Okay. Uh, speaker 7, Robbie Vapare. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, Go ahead. You have five hi. minutes to speak to Council and ask the clerk to start your timer. Okay, perfect. If my kids run in, I just I want to let you know they might be walking in and out. But hello, Mayor Stewart and Councillors. Uh, my name is Robbie Bopra, and I'd like to start by sharing my appreciation for the opportunity for me to speak tonight for my thoughts about the development project at 4575 Granville Street. I'm born and raised in Vancouver with my wife and kids. Uh, we're proud Vancouverites and wouldn't want to live anywhere else in Canada. That being said, I'm increasingly aware of and concerned about the housing crisis in our city and what this might mean for future generations like my daughter and son. Um, 
critically important that we get on top of the housing issues we're facing so that people have diversity and choice that will allow them to stay in Vancouver as the circumstances keep changing and ever evolving and our families keep growing. I'm 100% supportive of this uh, multifamily rental project on Gravel Street. I think projects like this are exactly what we need more of to help more provide more long-term rental options across the city. Um, projects like this will bring a bit more rental balance across neighborhoods and will provide 24 new homes for people like uh, my kids, maybe their kids' kids who want to stay here for long term. Um, I appreciate that the applicant has made a lot of changes to ensure that the building can respectfully interact with the neighboring hospice. And this certainly speaks to the kind of consideration that neighbors, that they would be for the future. Like, And this project, if it was approved tonight, which I highly recommend, is a great project and in a great neighborhood. And I really hope you can approve it here this tonight. And thank you. Great, thank you. Um, you don't have any questions from council, so I think your remarks were very clear. Thanks for taking time. Okay, uh, speaker number eight, Maximilian Lepur. Hello, Deputy Mayor Kirby Young and council. My name is Maximilian Lepur. I'm a youth residing in Vancouver. As a youth and current student at the University of British Columbia at the Vancouver campus, I've often found myself in precarious housing states given the lack of rentals in our city. I'm urging you to vote in support of this rental project. I was quite frankly disappointed that seven of our city councillors, Weeb, Hardwick, Carr, Bly, Fry, Swanson, and Kirby Young, voted against this rental project in the midst of a housing crisis back in 2019, particularly when this proposed development will not displace any renters and will instead convert a single family home into 24 secured rental units. This site has an excellent potential. I'll note that at UBC, many of my classmates and I have conversed over this project. Indeed, even our instructors have expressed concern at the 2019 decision. I mean, this site is along a direct bus route to UBC. One bus directly to UBC is within the blocks of this site. I'll also note, but it's also, this site's also within blocks to bicycle routes, the 29th Avenue bicycle route, the Cypress bikeway, and the Arbutus Greenway. All that said, I understand the council has expressed concern regarding a rental development next to hospice. That said, it's worth noting, as Melissa De Genova has, that the landowner can develop you know, up to a 12,000 square foot mansion without rezoning and engaging in public hearings. Such a development, which is possible, would not ameliorate the housing precariousness so many of them during our city. Many of my classmates and I have questioned council's decisions. Perhaps there's an implicit goal to prevent any rental in this neighborhood. And I'll also note concern about previous speakers from the hospice arguing that any development will be a disturbance. Uh, quite frankly, many of us see this as a faint attempt at blocking a development, given that the previous hospice director, Stephen Roberts, has proposed purchasing this site to develop senior residents. If they're against any development, such a thing would not be proposed. By approving rental projects in this area, renters will be able to contribute to and foster a diverse social community. Whilst I may not be able to immediately move into this development, those who can may free up older housing stocks that can be occupied by youth like me. Moreover, youth who have elderly parents living in the neighborhood will have an opportunity to move out whilst remaining close to their parents. Finally, I really appreciate the architectural designs of this project. Stuart Howard Architects has done an excellent job, and I really liked how they've ameliorated the 2019 drawings to accommodate the hospice's desire. For the sake of brevity and knowing how long these meetings will go for, I'll rest my comments here. I urge you to vote in favor of this development. Great, thank you so much. You do not have any questions from council, but thank you for um, showing up to speak tonight. Okay, speaker number nine, uh, and I can, would like would welcome being cor connect or corrected, I should say, on the pronunciation. Is it Ken Guramel? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. You have five minutes to speak to Council. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, hello, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is uh, is it John Gilma, but you can call me John. Uh, I am a youth residing in Vancouver. As a graduate and a young worker, I have found myself in search for a housing state, given the lack of rentals in our city. Um, I am in support of this rental project. I'm very happy to hear that this will convert a single family home into secured rental units for a handful of future young families and workers and students. Um, 
Um, I have worked extensively in construction as a carpenter and worked all over the city. However, I have yet to see a rental development proceed in this neighborhood. With the approval of this project, we can ensure that this neighborhood includes a diverse class of people and ensures a stable and resilient community is fostered. Uh, I understand that the city and council have rejected this application in 2019. This is of great concern to me, not least because we are in the midst of a housing crisis, as the previous speaker has said. This development respects the charter of neighborhood while providing rental community. Um, further collaboration with the neighborhood has sought since the initial refusal of 2019. Um, and the overall design was ameliorated. The neighbor's agreement with the hospice has been achieved as well. Once again, I approve of this project and thank you for your time, council and mayor and callers. Great, thank you so much. Okay, speaker number 10, Arsalan Shagan. Yeah. Um, Hi, good evening, I, you have five minutes to speak to council. Cool. Um, thank you council for letting me speak before you today. I'm calling in today to voice my strong support for this project. I'm a young adult in Vancouver, currently attending university, and uh, one of the biggest challenges that I've faced is finding rentals. I have spoken to council before regarding the need for increased rental units around the city and how vital that is right now. Um, this project is very close to transportation that goes directly to UBC. Having access to public transportation, especially when it's a direct bus with no transfers, is something that I'm looking for as a university student. Um, for someone like myself, there will be no need for parking at this site as the bus goes everywhere that I need to access really. Um, that being said, this will, this will be promoting a more sustainable lifestyle by being able to bus rather than drive everywhere. Um, while, while these homes may not be in my price point today, they will provide newer secured housing options for those who that can afford them today. Um, therefore, opening up the older housing stock that I may be able to afford. Um, yeah. Finally, I note that uh, city staff has recommended council to approve this project. I will echo their sentiments and urge council to approve this proposal. Thank you, everybody. Great, thank you so much. You don't have any questions from councilors, but thank you and have a good evening. Okay, speaker number 11, Natasha Latik. Hi, good evening. Um, good evening, council. Um, can you guys hear me okay? We can, uh, we can hear you perfectly, okay, go ahead. Cool. Perfect, I, I'm also a resident of Vancouver and I'll try not to take up too much more of your time as it seems I am echoing many of the sentiments that have already been shared with the previous speakers. I'm a millennial with a young family, and we too have experienced the difficulties in securing housing in Vancouver. It is very much a desirable place to live, and having grown up here, it's frustrating to see that many of my peers have had to move because of the lack of housing, which is why this development and the previous rejection of it came to, came to my attention. Um, while we understand it is difficult for the hospice to um, to operate with some of the disturbances proposed by construction, it also seems like it's an ine inevitable reality that they will have to face. And of the options available, building a 24-unit rental housing is more favorable than having a single-family home or a duplex put up. This is along a main arterial route, and it is quite centralized for young professionals that are looking to expand their families, such as myself. So I'm hoping you guys will take those points into consideration when discussing this and making your decision this evening. Uh, thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Natasha. I don't see any questions in council for you. Have a good night. You too. Okay, you too. Uh, uh, speaker 12, Felipe Alfaro. Great, uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly, go ahead. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Deputy Mayor and City Councilors. Uh, first of all, I wanna say that I appreciate being the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I, I, I sort of have been very much enlightened by some of the interventions that other speakers have made and having the ability to speak directly 
uh, to elected officials. I think it's great. So I, I think this sort of format uh, should be commended. Uh, and today I want to speak in favor of the project. Uh, I think as a Vancouverite myself, I think the issue of affordable housing uh, hits very close to home and having the ability to build 24 more units in an area such as Shaughnessy, I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, personally, at least for me, uh, the fact that uh, uh, I'm a young professional, I recently graduated from UBC, and so the fact that buses are accessible from the units, such as bus stand that would go to downtown Vancouver, I think that's that's great. As well as as well as biking, uh, I'm an avid biker, as a lot of Vancouverites are, and so the fact that there's so many bike spaces in the building, as well as only half an hour from downtown, I think it's I think it's great, and it would really help in terms of uh, congestion as I saw from the project that the the, the building manager or the, the builders actually changed the amount of parking spaces and prioritized bikes. I also want to say uh, in terms of the area it hits a lot of what Vancouverites want to see in terms of having access to to outdoor space, uh, spaces such as the Bandus and Botanical Gardens. I know I've really enjoyed that uh, when I did it in the past and living in a unit close to it uh, would, would be great. Um, so yeah I want to say too you know, I understand. Well, the chances of me living in this, uh, living in this particular unit, are low. The fact that other young professionals and especially families might be able to take advantage of it is great. I think uh, that that's that's what we want to see, and that, I think that's why people in uh, tonight are, are speaking in favor of this project, not necessarily because they'll be able to live in it, but because their neighbors and their family and their community might be able to take advantage of it. Um, so yeah, I just I just wanted to, to speak on this on this project. Um, as I mentioned, housing affordability has has been difficult to me. For me, when I lived in Vancouver, at one point I found myself living in a house with six people, or, and at one point seven people. Uh, and I know other young people uh, tonight might might have similar experiences. And the last thing that I wanted to mention, I think some of the things that were brought up by uh, uh, in, in in the context of the hostess and also. Uh, in terms of oh, uh, Chauncey being a relatively residential neighborhood, uh, I don't. I, I think you know that the short-term impact of of some of the the inconveniences of construction and noise. I don't think those compare to the long-term benefits of a rental unit in this area. And I, I would like to leave it off, for example, with the words of uh, President Truman that said, "Imperfect action is better than perfect inaction." I think that, that, that uh, um, the fact that we need to take action on, on housing right now, it's, it's crucial. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope uh, I hope City Council votes accordingly and in favor of this project. Uh, thank you so much and good luck with the, the rest of the meeting tonight. Great, thank you, Felipe. Have a good night. Okay, speaker number 13, Ryan Shahi. Uh, you're a little muffled. Maybe you could speak a bit closer to the phone or microphone. Can you hear now? That's be that's better. Go ahead. You have five minutes okay. to speak to council. Okay, perfect. Hello, uh, Mayor Stewart and members of council. My name is Ryan. Um, I'm here to offer my support for the rental project that has been proposed at 4575 Campbell Street. I'd like to keep my comments brief because I think a lot has already been said that I agree with. Many people in their early 20s, like myself, struggle with Vancouver's housing market, and there isn't enough viable, affordable housing options available. Right? It's likely the reason a lot of young people just stay at home longer. So I understand that the housing proposed at 4575 Granville Street may not be considered affordable to someone in their 20s, but I'm sure there will be a strong demand for these units from working professionals and families, and also for the upcoming generation coming up. This is in turn frees up older and more affordable places for younger people not yet into their careers. And I think what it comes down to is that we need more rental housing options in this city, and the more supply that is built today, the more affordable housing we have in the future, essentially. Right? I hope you will vote in favor of this project. I'd really, I'd really like to see it. Um, move forward and uh, thank you council thank you so much uh you don't have any questions from council so thank you for calling in thank you thank you um okay speaker 14 michelle folinas 
Hi, uh, good evening, Mayor and Councillors. I am calling to state my support for the project. Uh, I'm calling because a good friend of mine works in the area and has brought the revised proposal to my attention. And as a young person interested in housing issues, I, I just felt compelled to dial in and share some of my thoughts. So first, as someone who lives in a similar four-story building right now, I can speak to you know living in a similar type of building as to the one proposed in the project. And it promotes a really great sense of community and I personally love living in this type of space. Uh, in addition, with access to a bus to UBC and bike routes, these additional rental options have the potential to provide more housing options for students. And as a student, I understand how difficult and stressful it is to try and find affordable housing with direct access to a university. I appreciate having the opportunity to speak before you tonight. And you know, I really wanna thank you for hearing my thoughts and perspectives along with the other speakers and members of the community. As a young person who has a vested interest in affordable housing rentals, I again would like to reiterate my support for the project. Uh, to conclude, I really just hope that upon voting, you consider the need for affordable housing in Vancouver, uh, as well as the potential benefit that this project can bring to the city. Great, uh, thank you very much, Michelle. No questions from council. Have a good night. Okay, speaker number 15, Devin Husak. Speaker 15, Devin Husak. Hi, sorry, can you hear me now? We can hear you. You have five minutes to make your comments, so right. go ahead when you're ready. My, my apologies. Uh, good evening, Chair Kirby Young and members of City Council. My name is Devin Husick, and even though it only makes things easier for me physically, I'm happy I can speak to you tonight from my home rather than City Hall. It's actually surprising how hard it is to talk about this application, because when I do, I can't help but think of how my mother slowly suffered gasping for air as she lay dying from cancer in our home. You hear from many people, so I don't expect you to remember that I told you about that when I spoke to support the previous rental homes proposed here in 2019. Your decision to reject them isn't why I find it hard to speak tonight. Rather, it's because of the abuse I endured afterwards. You see, when I left City Hall that night, there were a group of people waiting for me outside, and though they were never physically violent, they were cruel. When they asked how dare I support these, those homes, I tried to ignore them, and I wished them a good night. After all, it's hard to pour your heart out, but it's worse to hear a group of adults claiming you sold your, your dead mother. I don't know all the reasons our civil discourse has become so toxic, but I do know it doesn't help to question the motives of people who sacrifice their time and well-being to engage in the civil process. Personally, I find questions of whether people live in Vancouver or what they do for a living to be horrible. Where does it end? Can't we disagree without impugning each other's motives? I can admit I still don't agree with your decision, but I respect it, and all of you. I won't lie, this revised concept clearly does several things better. After all, there's a reason the Vancouver Hospice Society is now willing to consider supporting these homes, and anyone can see that significant efforts have been made to accommodate them. Granted, I can identify all of them, and I'm not really sure why flipping this building around makes any major difference, but apparently it does. Still, I can't help but wonder if those things could have been done without delaying these homes by two years. Even with the pandemic, it's hard to understand how much time that really is, how many hours teachers from the nearby Three nearby schools have spent driving home rather than enjoying moments with their own family. Nor can I imagine what it must be like to endure the trauma of working in a hospital and then have to spend hours driving home in highway traffic. There's no way to hit an undo button and get that time back. Our actions have consequences. In years past, following your guidance, any hope of creating attainable homes in Shaughnessy has been stripped away from the secured rental policy, which you haven't even yet approved. This community could have been enriched, not by Hollywood film crews, by, the, by new rentals. By new retail stores, rental housing too, places for people to eat and the laughter of children. Would that have really harmed the character of the neighborhood? In the darkest days of the last century, Shaughnessy became a place where multiple families could share one roof, and that is the character we've let die over these decades since. I ask you to join me to let's restore that heritage by improving these 24 homes. Because two years is too long to wait. Two years ago, I still at least had a father. In another two years, how many people won't either? The time we have together is short and precious. Let's spend, let's 
that families spend it together rather than on a train, a bus, or driving past multi-million dollar hedged hidden mansions on Granville Street. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. You don't have any questions from council, but thank you for calling in. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, speaker 16, Rebecca Hartley. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can, go ahead, you have five minutes. Great, uh, good evening, Chairperson and City Council. My name's Rebecca, and I'm happy to get the chance to once again support the proposed rezoning of 4575 Granville Street. Well, it's great to see that 24 renters will, with your permission, get a chance to contribute to this community and call it home. I'm disappointed by the consequences of your previous decision to reject it. Yes, nurses, doctors, teachers, and other professionals that our city and this neighborhood desperately need will have the chance to live here, but they will not have less space to do so. I imagine that's due to the costs involved with having to redo this entire process, especially since both the neighboring hospice and this developer were operating in good faith. Had you imposed specific conditions, maybe we wouldn't have to wait. How wouldn't have had to wait for two years. Despite this delay, I appreciate this project still aligns well with our city's climate goal, as there is excellent transit in the area, like the 10 that could take you downtown in minutes, or the Arbutus Greenway a few blocks away that, uh, for those that want a bike. To facilitate this, the number of bike parking spots are being included too. While only 17 vehicle parking stalls will be offered for these homes, I think we can all agree there won't be any lack of street parking. Your recent decision to reject street parking permits clearly highlights this community is rich with availability, given the presence of long driveways and private garages. Considering this, I find it puzzling the city is requiring a dedication along the property's east side for a future widening of Granville Street. If creating a safer road for residents is actually the goal, do we really need four lanes of vehicle traffic in either direction? If anything, Dedicating one of the existing six lanes for bikes or buses would make more sense than giving even more green space to pavement. In contrast, this design ensures there will be ample amounts of greenery on the property. Rather than just a large hedge isolating and cutting the community apart, it provides spaces for residents to gather, children to play, green roofs for the birds, and a large respectful buffer to the sensitive needs next door. I know some feel these rental homes will never be able to fit into Shaughnessy, but I don't believe that because it's hard to argue that this won't be good for this neighborhood, but this isn't the type of gentle change the community can easily accommodate. While I hope you decide to be leaders and address that larger need sooner than later, I hope you'll agree with me that this application has done enough and deserves your approval. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. I don't see any questions from uh, council, but thank you for calling in tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so seeing that uh, we've concluded the registered speakers list, I'm going to commence uh, calling three times for additional speakers. If there are any additional speakers to the item who wish to speak to council at this point, please call toll free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 88437-POUND before the close of the speakers list. The phone number will be tweeted out at Van City Clerk and it's also available on the live stream. Um, any speakers that are in the council chambers, uh, please come forward to the podium. That is my first call. Second call for, final call for speakers. If there are additional speakers again for the item who wish to speak to council, you may call toll free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 88437-POUND. Um, before close of the speakers list. Again, the phone number is available at Van City Clerk and on the live stream, and any speakers um, at City Hall can come forward. Okay, third and final call for additional speakers uh, to call 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 88437-POUND. Before close of the speakers list, the number again available at Van City Clerk and on the live stream, and I'm not seeing any speakers in the podium. Clerk, can I ask you to confirm if you have had any additional speakers call in? There are no speakers currently. Okay. Great, thank you. I'm gonna suggest that we take a five minute recess at this point, uh, just to see if any other calls have um, do come in and make sure we give everybody an opportunity. So we will reconvene at 8.38 p.m. Thanks, everybody.
Okay, everybody. Um, welcome back. Clerk, just confirming there are no additional speakers who have phoned in. I'm just double checking, Chair, if you give me a moment. Okay, I am hearing there are no speakers on the line, and I'm also hearing we have no in-person speakers. So okay. that's the end of the speakers. Thank you for the confirmation. So seeing as there are no additional speakers, the speakers list is now closed. Um, and as few or no public comments were received on this item after 5 p.m. today, I suggest we now also close the receipt of public comments and move on to hearing closing comments, asking further questions of staff and to make a decision. So at this time, does the applicant have any closing comments? Yes, thank you, Councillor. Um, I just wanted to briefly just say um, to reaffirm our commitment to the uh, Good Neighbor Agreement uh, and working with the hospice and to once again thank the hospice for their uh, genuine um, engagement with us and, and, to, and by accepting and taking the hand that was extended to them. It's just been quite, quite encouraging um, the second time around. Great. Thank you very much. And do staff have any closing comments at this time? Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. No further comments. Okay, thank you. Um, and now to, can, I see we have a number of councillors, uh, I'm assuming they have questions to staff. Uh, so I'm going to advance Councillor Fry. Go ahead. Yeah, and uh, I was hoping to be able to, to move this as well as someone who had voted against the first iteration. I'm really uh, looking forward to supporting this. Uh, but I did have some questions of staff as well. I'm just curious, we did hear um, from the uh, the hospice around uh, concerns that they had with the inability to maybe go out and deal with some of the management of noise issues or what have you, as they were also tending to the business of running the hospice. I'm wondering if, if um, the staff contemplated any kind of um, specific resolution to these kind of concerns and if there was something that you might specifically avail the hospice staff to mitigate any of those kind of concerns. Hoping that there aren't any, of course, but, and it sounds like they're working really well together, but. Staff contemplated anything like that? Uh, thank you, Councillor Fryer, for the question. The uh, the formal channels for any members of the public uh, is through our 311 line, or they can also reach out to the file manager or staff person at that time should they have concerns. Staff have been consulting with the hospice throughout the previous application and are well aware of the hospice's concerns. Uh, so we that we anticipate that we we that dialogue will continue as well through the development permit stage. Thank you. Great, thanks, and I, and I really appreciate the attention staff have given this, and, and the applicant, of course. Um, it's great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Councillor DiGenova, you have the floor. Thanks, and I too was actually hoping to move the motion as someone who voted in favor of this, but I suppose we'll see when we get there to that queue. Um, I, I did wanna ask staff a, a few questions about what the timeline would look like um, if this moves forward and this application uh, receives uh, the majority of council's support tonight, when would we see um, occupancy potentially for these, un these units delivered, considering the 24 um, family homes uh, that are being proposed here? Thank you. Uh, thank, you uh, thank you for the question. Uh, if approved this evening, typically the, the permitting process takes approximately another uh, year to year and a half, and then there, there's construction. I'm not exactly certain of a construction schedule yet, so uh, we haven't been given that information. It's very early. Um, uh, approximately, I'm, I hear that it's approximately 12 months from construction, so possibly to occupancy anywhere between uh, two years, two, 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 two and a half years two to two and a half years and would that would there be any extra time or, or delays in that process or would staff work with the applicant if this were approved to understand that they they have um, through the good neighbor agreement with the hospice uh, uh, said that they would uh, would try and adjust their methods of construction uh, where possible to try and and also uh, adjust our timelines if we could to expedite that. 
considering uh, the good neighbor agreement and what the uh, applicant's trying to achieve here? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Could you clarify your question? Is is it? Are I you asking if more on the permitting side? If this application is approved, there's certain concessions that the applicant would be making for the hospice, which I understand aren't in um, the current uh, zoning. It's it's currently not outlined in the schedule, and those were some of the questions that I had earlier. So this doesn't apply to other developments in a specific um, zoning or district schedule, but it's specific to some of the concerns that came before. So because there was a good neighbor agreement, because that could, I'm assuming from some of the questions that I asked, could possibly, and what I understood was could possibly um, interrupt or adjust the timeline. I'm wondering if, if the city also would be able to adjust um, you know, certain measures to expedite permits if, for instance, there were certain pieces that were taking a little bit longer because the applicant was respecting um, the good neighbor agreement and their construction um, agreements with uh, the hospice. Um, I, hello, Council. It's Yarda McNeil, Assistant Director of Planning for Rezoning. Um, we don't have an expediting process for anything other than 100% social housing projects where we have dedicated teams and, and council has resourced that program um, uh, over several years. We will obviously work in good faith with the applicant through the next phases of the process, which is a development permit, a building permit, and an occupancy permit, um, and continue to work with the owner throughout that process to make sure that things go smoothly. So we can commit to that part, but we can't expedite because we don't have that system for things that are not 100% Thanks very much. I appreciate that and understand this is a unique situation, but the short program uh, right now only applies to social housing. Thanks very much. Thanks, Councillor. That's just, all right now. Thank you. And, and I'm want, not at six minutes. I just wanted I, to note was, that my timer continued on. I was on. actually just going to note that, that I actually was running the other timer, because uh, just to let Councillors know we're having a glitch. So, Councillor, did you know it was actually under four minutes? Um, I just, we're having a glitch with the Council timers, but we are tracking. Um, thanks, Councillor. Um, Councillor Hardwick, you have the floor. Questions of staff? Yeah, really quickly. Um, uh, Councillor Fry touched on it, and and this came from uh, uh, from the hospice discussion about a focal point for accountability. And so I just want to ask that question one more time, just to really emphasize this: Who will be the focal point for accountability from the city? Uh, thank you, Councillor Hardwick, for the question. Um, so, as previously mentioned, the first point, of, the first touch point for anyone in the public, including the hospice, would be through our 311 line, should there be uh, something untoward or something unusual happening. The city has tools and bylaws to mitigate construction impacts uh, in advance of construction. Should also know that the city also approves uh, street use permits and uh, and closures to ensure thoughtful construction access. So. The city has been in discussion, staff have been in discussion with the hospice, and we are well aware of their concerns, and we'll, we are investigating options uh, and, and continue to look at different options for maintaining construction access. There's, there is going to be a staff file manager throughout the, the, the rest of the development permit uh, process. But like I said, the first point of contact is 311. Thank you. Um, that was very clear. And my second question again has been asked uh, uh, of the proponent, but I'm going to ask you the same question, and that is regarding the good neighbor agreement timeline. Um, what does the city see as uh, the timeline for the good neighbor agreement? Again, we've heard it from the proponent, we've heard it from the hospice. What does the city say? Uh, thank you for that question, Councillor. Um, the, the good neighbor agreement is the agreement between both parties and, and uh, they are free to, to, to conclude that agreement uh, at their discretion at, at their timing. So we don't have any, we just monitor it generally as part of our over, over, uh, oversight process. The city is not party to the agreement. It's between the hospice and, it would be between the hospice and the developer. And for that reason, we, we're not involved necessarily in in saying when it should be done, uh, it's it's up to the both parties to conclude that. I understand that it's between the two parties. I'm just uh, interested in ensuring that we keep an eye on things, but thank you very much. Appreciate the answers. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Councillor Carr, I just ask the clerk to reset your timer. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, my first question was about the good neighbor agreement. Well, actually, both are, but um, but you just answered that um, you don't monitor. But surely, if there was a breakdown in the good neighbor agreement, would there be an avenue um, for uh, the hospice society to actually contact the city? Uh, thank you, Councillor, for the question. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, certainly as the hospice continues to to uh, sorry. As the developer continues to move through the development permit process, there will be a file manager uh, on that file. That is, this, that is a staff person contact, and uh, certainly that, that is one means to get to, uh, to, to talk about what's going on and to share their concerns as well. Okay. Um, I was also taken by the fact that the um, uh, Vancouver Hospital Society um, indicated that there wasn't uh, um, they, they were interested in, in facilitated uh, discussion, but the city had no list of potential facilitators, so they um, worked through, or maybe it was the, the applicant, I can't remember now who said it, but they, they had to go to North Van um, and check their list, two of, of which were former city planners in Vancouver. Um, have we contemplated having a list of um, individuals who could possibly facilitate discussions in a situation such as we've had around the um, application uh, uh, next door to the hospice society site. Um, we don't. We don't have an official. We don't have a list. And one of the things that the city is careful about is not to be selective of or to to, to recommend or to give anyone any sort of competitive commercial advantage. Uh, for this reason, we, we don't formally keep a list. We encourage the applicant to go out and, and find one, and they did. Mm, interesting. Maybe it's something we can pursue further in conversation. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor, I see no one else on the list. I am prepared to, at this point, move the recommendations in the report. Yes, there did seem to be a, a popular desire to do that. So, seconder? Moved Second, by Councilor, Councilor Di Genova. Okay, moved by Councilor Carr, seconded by Councilor Di Genova. Um, and uh, if there's any debate, please put yourselves on the queue. Councillor Carr, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it was a, I, I did spend time, um, several times visiting uh, the Vancouver Hospital Society, hearing the concerns. Um, it was a very long um, a debate on this issue at, at the fir uh, first application. Uh, a number of concerns were raised, and I'm really happy to see um, those current uh, those concerns having been addressed in the second application, um, particularly the overlook, um, not just the overlook of the back of the property, which is um, an extremely important place in terms of um, the need for privacy as as a family's loved one um, leaves um, and uh, but also, there's a that wonderful little patio that um, that, that residents and staff use that were, were, is adjacent to this site, um, and there was concern about that. So the setbacks, the privacy screening, um, I, you know, all of that I think was very sensitively considered and modified in this application. Uh, I think to the um, frontage, many people con uh, were concerned about the look of Granville Street and the fact that the loss of the hedges and um, there is there is an attention to that. The concern around construction, and I'm very impressed by the fact that the applicant has um, has looked to reduce the underground um, uh, car park area, reducing the actual time um, uh, that the construction would have to take place in terms of uh, uh, the construction of those uh, parking stalls. Um, so, you know, really, I think that this is, um, this is a good addition um, to the housing. It's market rental. It's not affordable market rental. It's just market rental, which um, people um, have said many, many times over time becomes more increasingly affordable. But, um, uh, but I'm, I'm pleased at the way the applicant has responded to the concerns through the facilitated um, discussions and a real commitment to address um, those concerns that were raised at the first iteration of this proposal. So um, 
congratulations um, uh, to the applicant on uh, really taking seriously those concerns um, uh, to the Hospice Society for your diligence in raising those concerns and coming out for, for the first time and then being willing to go through facilitated discussions with the applicant. Um, I really laud you all for those efforts and happy to have moved this. Great, thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, Councillor DiGenova. There we go. Well, happy to have seconded this or uh, moved this, but I'm supporting this again for the second time around. And uh, although I do appreciate the fact that the applicant has made um, concessions and moved forward with a good neighbor agreement and happy to see that in the way that that's moved forward. Um, I also am apprehensive about the next time council that we do see a development in this area and the friction and the you know, individual good neighbor agreements that will have to come forward. So I hope in situations like this, where there are, you know, very sensitive um, uh, types of use, uh, and in this case, the hospice, and I have a lot of empathy for that. Uh, but at the same time, I would hope that there would be some type of process they could go through uh, to make sure that there was consultation and that they could vet that as well. Um, so that they're not always having to sort of cross their fingers and hope about future developments and at the same time negotiate good neighbor agreements sort of, um, you know, as, as applications kind of come forward because there's no other way forward there. Um, that being said, you know, some of the things that certainly struck me and I know we have to consider this application and we're in a quasi judicial body. Um, so I'm only considering the other application in the context that it's been presented in this um, in the report from staff, which um, first of all, I really like to commend our staff. Uh, I, th I feel that uh, our staff have had a large part in sort of facilitating this, uh, being able to come back and provide 24 um, more affordable and market rental is still hard to find in our city, but more affordable than uh, some of the homes that we would normally find in this neighborhood. Um, on a transit route uh, close by to UBC and accessible, uh, you know, for a number of different reasons um, and family housing also. Uh, I appreciate that the applicant has gone above and beyond and I really wanna thank the applicant uh, because you could have, um, built uh, without going through this process uh, a 13,000 square foot home that didn't have to go through the types of concessions and agreements that you've chosen to move forward with. So I commend you for that. Thank you for doing that. And I, I'm extremely happy to hear that the hospice uh, has felt that this has been a respectful process. That's what I heard them say tonight. Uh, the speaker who spoke on behalf of that organization. Um, that being said, I understand that hospices have different needs and uh, not all of them are going to be the same. Uh, you know, I I live very close by, uh, half a block away from a hospice in my neighborhood that uh, has a children's playground and recently the park board um, implemented a community garden and the hospice didn't have any um, anything to say about that was my understanding. So uh, I understand that there are different issues and different mitigation strategies perhaps for hospices, but I also understand that, you know, there's, there's a unique way uh, in that uh, this hospice perhaps uh, and and their membership have, have uh, wanted to move forward. So I appreciate that the applicant has been very respectful of that. Um, I am concerned about the affordability of these housing units. I mean, on the other hand, at the same time, it's not about trade-offs here, but when we look at sites, um, I'm sorry, Chair, I think someone may not be on mute. I'm just hearing some background noise just, just to share that. But when we look at the city of Vancouver and we look at, uh, you know, I know this isn't the same as Little Mountain, but when we look at sites and, and the affordability that could be achieved on those sites and families and, you know, top of mind for me is, um, you know, one of the speakers, Devin, and I do remember uh, that very heartfelt story uh, uh, about uh, Devin's mother um, and, and the pain he went through or the pain Devin went through. And I just wanted to say that, um, here is someone who has been through a situation like that, who is still um, sees the value in this housing. So uh, 
wholeheartedly supported this the first time. I'm happy to support it the second time and second this motion, and I'll leave it there. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Weeb, you have the floor, go ahead. And if the clerk, if you can reset Councillor Weeb's timer, please. Yeah, I wanna thank all the speakers that came last time and this time. I think it's integral that we look at our process. Um, this is, rec we now have a process in front of us and a building that has a better relationship between um, the hospice next door, the neighbors nearby, and the new residents that are gonna move in. And I think in community building, this is critical. I think that we need to figure out better ways for developers, staff, and the neighbors to work together to make the buildings the best fit our neighborhoods and meet the needs of everyone. I think that is a big part of, I wanna learn from this project and how we can moving forward, make sure that we are having community input that makes the difference in what we get developed and how we can get more input early so we don't need to wait two years. And so the proposals that do come to council have this buy-in and developers do take the time to work with the community, put their input and really deliver projects that improve um, the well-being of neighbors, residents, and the people that are going to live here and call this home. I think it's a beautifully well-designed designed building now. Um, I really appreciate all the changes that have been made. Um, I think the hedges and the and setbacks. I appreciate that it's not a full site excavation and that we're able to almost half the parking spots. I think that um, the developers listened and I really appreciate that and I will be supportive of this project. Terrific, thank you, Councillor Weeb. Uh, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you very much. So thinking back to where we were previously on this, uh, I think it was a cautionary tale of what happens when there isn't a thorough public process. The good news is coming out of it that the proponent worked with, with uh, the hospice through a process and has arrived at a conclusion that is supportable by all of this council. Um, it means that much more because there were questions about its neighborliness and uh, those have been addressed. And on that basis, you know, I for one am in, in now in a position to, to support this development, but it's not just a rubber stamping process for us. We are adjudicating these things as we see them and, and determine their merits on a case by case basis. This now, meets the sniff test as it were and and uh, I suspect this will be approved unanimously um, so on the merits of the neighborhood agreement that's been entered into and the changes that have been made this is a worthy project I just I still um, frustrated though uh, what I would say to the proponent is that for the speakers that called in support when you hear the same script over and over again it is is problematic, but um, I think what is really persuasive here is the fact that you've gone the extra mile working with the hospice and uh, other professionals to arrive at a solution uh, that's making everybody uh, satisfied enough to move forward. So thanks for doing the extra work and going the extra mile. Um, I, you did the right thing, uh, but we don't need to uh, stack meetings to get the response, which I think is going to be positive. Thank you. Thank, <clears throat> sorry. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Councillor Borrell, you have the floor. Um, thanks, and I'll be really brief. I just wanted to say I, I um, supported this project in its uh, first iteration, and I am quite happy to support it now. Uh, I think, as Council and the public has heard me say many times, I think it's really important that we build more secure rental housing in every neighborhood. And this neighborhood in particular um, has uh, been off limits to most Vancouverites at most income levels for a very long time. Uh, and, and in a city as diverse as ours, I don't think we should have neighborhoods uh, where, um, where renters aren't uh, able to find a home. So I'm glad to see this project move forward. I hope we continue to see secure rental uh, built um, in all of our neighborhoods. Uh, and this is a, is a good example. Thanks. 
Excellent. Thanks, Councillor Boyle. Councillor Fry, you're up. Well, thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, I won't take up too much time. Um, just to say that, uh, you know, reflecting on this process, it was uh, the time of the first vote. I recall there was a lot of criticism, people suggesting, and congratulations, you've just uh, forced nothing but mansions in this spot. Um, and and of course, uh, that's not the case today. And and I, and I do really want to credit uh, Pablo's, the developers, for for sticking it through and going back with their architects and, and our staff for recognizing that we were, uh, you know, rejecting some pretty flawed policy direction from the previous administration that suggested that this actually did need to be oversubscribed with parking and, and a lot to lot with excavation that would have negatively impacted one of a handful of hospices in our city. And and that, that it just really wasn't a great, great fit uh, for that existing use, recognizing that they're really, and, you know, I, I know that there was a, a number of new speakers who maybe didn't have a full kind of comprehension of what had gone down in that particular uh, um, public hearing two years ago, but we heard a lot of folks uh, with, you know, very legitimate concerns around the function of, of this hospice and how it was gonna, gonna survive uh, a significant excavation for parking cars. Uh, and so it's ironic that we're now revisiting this with a less of, a, of an overbuilt parking um, component to this development, uh, given the the way the vote went last week as far as street parking and, and parking permits and a modest fee uh, to to consider the real cost of of parking private vehicles in public space. So that irony aside, I think this is a far better project. I really appreciate how developer and the architects are working with the hospice to ensure that 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 they're doing this in a respectful manner that respects the dignity of people's uh, final days and and I really um, feel good about how this has landed, and I'm really, really, really grateful to the, the applicant for for recognizing that, that critical need with the hospice, for seeing it through despite the sort of negative setback, to the architect for talking to the developers and saying, look, I, I see a way forward, because there was a way forward, and um, it was unfortunate we had to reject it outright. That was the advice we got from the director of planning at the time, that we needed a whole new public hearing. As I recall, we were willing to amend it on the fly and say, hey, just get rid of half the parking and we're good, but it wasn't to be. So here we are two years later with a much better project, with a much better relationship between neighbors and a fantastic opportunity for rental housing that will mirror the one that we approved last year across the street. Uh, and I think it's great. And it's uh, more appropriately transit oriented development because we don't need that amount of parking on, on a transit corridor as some of the speakers have pointed out. Uh, so it's great, really happy to support this and uh, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Fry, and I will take the opportunity to provide a couple of closing comments myself. And um, it was noted, I think, by a couple of speakers with respect to the last vote and um, how that laid out. And I, I stand by that vote, and I and I stand by my vote, and I'm going to support this project tonight. And, and I didn't support it last time, and I'm, I'm going to make a couple of comments as to why. And that is that I think that some things are immeasurable, and the quality of life for somebody um, who is at that point, I, I, I think, cannot be literally uh, quantified. And it was interesting to learn how few hospice resources we actually have in the city of Vancouver. I think last time we learned it was about three. This has eight beds. Um, and we did hear overwhelmingly from the public, not not sort of different perspectives in terms of one side and, and another and a balance, but a very significant, as Councillor Fry mentioned, um, amount of people that came out with very specific stories about what it meant um, for their loved ones and end, end of life and quality of care. And with respect to the construction there, um, I know it's been an arduous process. Um, I, I heard the applicant say that and I recognize that um, in terms of the work that has been done. Um, but I don't think that we can proceed at all costs when we have something that has such a huge community um, impact. And I think that it is, um, I'd also agree that it is a better project now. Um, it was noted that uh, We've got the parking reduction by approximately 50%, so we see a reduction in GHGs there. To the comments earlier about affordability, um, yes, time costs money, but um, that also means that there is uh, cost savings with respect to the parking, which um, as well as the environmental benefit. Um, I would also note that um, I think it was very positive, and I really appreciate things such as the alternative construction methods. I look forward to learning more about that, um, given the unique nature um, of a hospice, and I, I think for anybody that didn't have a chance to hear um, what it's like for somebody and what uh, sort of what a service like this has meant, um, 
I would encourage them to really think about that or to go back and review the tapes. And I, I had a relative that was in a hospice actually just a couple months ago um, and went to a spot and you, you, you really cannot understate the importance of sort of that quality of experience. But I think that um, there's been a great effort, um, a significant effort on both sides to pull this together. Um, I'm really excited to see additional rental housing um, and in this neighborhood. And we've also got a net additional three units than was there previously. So now at 24 um, instead of 21, which I think is another positive as well. So um, I know that uh, people are probably feeling a bit tired after this one, um, but uh, I think that the effort's noted and really appreciated, um, and I'm very happy to support the project tonight. Okay, so uh, without seeing any other comments from council, I'm gonna ask the clerk to take us to a vote. Councillor Fry, I'm not seeing a vote from you. Do you need a vote assist? Oh, I do now, okay. Great, uh, so that has passed. I'm sure people will happily hear um, with none in opposition. And that concludes item number three. Now, council, it's been a long stretch and we do have to change staff for the next item. So I'm gonna suggest we take a five minute break um, to allow the staff switch over and give council a chance to stretch their legs. Uh, so we'll come back at 9.15 PM, thanks.
All right, everybody, we are back for our final item this evening. Uh, item four, piloting regulatory changes to support commercial renovations and small business. And before we begin, do we have any members of council uh, that wish to declare a conflict of interest on item number four? Okay, seeing none, um, I will uh, ask the clerk to read the application and summary of correspondence received, please. This is an application by the city manager to amend section 4.8 of the zoning and development bylaw to exempt low risk, low impact changes of use in commercial zone from the, required, from the requirement to submit a development permit for a pilot period of 24 months. The exemption would apply to businesses changing within the following use categories. General office, retail store, healthcare office, barbershop or beauty salon, and beauty and wellness center. Related building bylaw, parking bylaw amendments are being considered. If approved, this amendment would reduce the complexity of the permits and allow new businesses to occupy suites in a shorter period of time. No correspondence has been received on this application since referral to public hearing. Great, thank you very much. Um, if there are any speakers for this item who wish to speak to council, please call toll free 1 353 8610, uh, followed by participant code 88437 pound um, before the close of the speakers list. The phone number will be tweeted out at Van City Clerk and made available on the live stream. And there will be an opportunity for those on the phone or in person to speak at the end of the registered speakers list. So we now have Andrea Law, General Manager, Development, Business, and Building and licensing here to present the application. Unless council would like to waive, but we do have one speaker registered to this, so unless Move I to waive. Uh, is there any? Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Are there any councillors that would like to see the presentation? I would like to see it as this is an important presentation. Okay, thanks, Council Weave. Uh, staff, please go ahead. I'll withdraw my motion. It, it doesn't require a motion, uh, Council Dijanova. We just have a practice. If anyone wants to see it, we go I'm ahead. I'm aware, but I did make a motion, so I'll withdraw it. Thank you. The Mayor and Council, um, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening uh, to speak to you on this issue. So we are, just give me one moment and I will share. Okay, so thank you. We're here today to seek council approval for temporary changes uh, to the zoning and development bylaw, the building bylaw, and the parking bylaw. The focus of these initiatives, um, as you've seen in the report, is to support, is more support for the commercial sector uh, as well as small business. So staff are bringing all three bylaw changes together as it's the combination of these recommendation policy changes that will benefit permit processing and support for the commercial sector. Um, as you heard, we will be reviewing the impact of these changes and report back on findings at the conclusion of a 24 month pilot. So a little bit more on the policy changes for consideration today. Uh, the first opportunity is looking at aligning project definitions in the Vancouver building bylaw with the scope of work being undertaken thereby reducing upgrade requirements and project complexity. So the two strategies we're focusing on um, are around uh, subdividing uh, suites into two or more suites, treating that as a minor renovation, as opposed to a ma major renovation, which is how they're processed today. We're also looking at uh, relaxing the small suite definition to allow uh, more occupants um, in, a ten in a tenant space. So right now it's 60, uh, individuals, we're looking to increase that to 100. So we're, when we look at this strategy, the focus here is really looking at emerging models of office uses, uh, some coming out of COVID, um, some we've just heard over the years has been a major pain point. Something as simple as, as doing a tenant improvement uh, can trigger a major upgrade to the building. 
So this initiative is really looked at looking at processing uh, these permits uh, more expeditiously for this scope of work. The second opportunity is around reducing permitting and licensing times, application complexity, as well as startup costs for new businesses changing between specific uses. So the first strategy is around exempting a development permit. Um, quite often a change of use between these occupancies can trigger a development permit. A uh, second strategy is looking at waiving change of occupancy upgrades. Um, again, we see when we're interchanging between these occupancies, often it triggers um, upgrades that are, uh, can be very costly for small businesses looking to set up business fairly quickly and timely. The third strategy is around parking bylaw and increasing the threshold for meeting parking minimums uh, from 200 square meters to 300 square meters. That number is more in line with uh, sort of the tenant size of tenant spaces that we see uh, with small businesses. So looking a little bit closer at aligning project definitions with work scope. So the benefits we, we see here or anticipate seeing here obviously will be around simplifying the application process, diverting projects to faster processing streams, uh, removing costly upgrade triggers uh, for adding something as simple as a demising wall, and again, supporting recovery um, as it will be simpler and less costly to re reconfigure these office spaces. Uh, risk we've identified is potential for building stock to miss an upgrade cycle, um, but it's important to note that all new work will need to still comply with the Vancouver Building Bylaw. Looking a bit deeper into the impacts from change of use or occupancy. So the current challenge we have um, is that any new businesses that change between the following five low risk occupancies or land uses can face longer processing times um, and, and trying to get a business license if the change triggers a development permit or a building code upgrade. So as you can see from this graph, this shows the frequency of use changes between these uh, land uses and occupancies, sort of over a one year period from the spring of 2020 to the spring of 2021. So these are identified as sort of common um, use changes, obviously retail store being um, the most significant. Uh, so these were identified as potentially fairly low risk um, opportunities to explore. So we're looking at the benefits uh, from this. Uh, we're looking to get business licenses uh, issued faster by bypassing development permits and building code upgrades uh, and looking to support recovery um, as it will be simpler and less costly. The risks here, again, we're looking at a potential uh, missed opportunity to upgrade building stock. But um, yeah, just the potential um, is offset by the benefit of having more spaces leased. Uh, there's also a land use uh, issue with increased office uses at street level. In our, a lot, many of our commercial zones, we have a requirement for retail service uses at grade uh, for pedestrian interest. So again, we're looking at this being offset by uh, benefit of having more spaces leased. So that is the end of the presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. And we also have staff members on uh, on the call to answer questions as well. So thank you. Great, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I do have some questions from councillors. Councillor Weep, go ahead. Yeah, my first one is on the relaxation of parking spaces. Um, it has very specific areas of the city and I know that there are business areas outside of those specific areas that um, have struggled to bring in businesses like fitness centers and others. Can you talk about how this will expand that and is there ability to put more flexibility in some of our clauses like 4.2 and 5.2 um, to reduce the number of parking spaces needed if there's adequate transit or if the business can show a plan um, so that they don't have to go through this generous process. Yes, thank you for the question, Councillor Weeb. Uh, so Two issues, I guess I can speak to um, regarding that. So yes, we do have um, the ability in the parking bylaw to relax parking. Uh, we do that um, on a regular basis, uh, looking at applications on a case by case basis, uh, looking at the impact in the neighborhood, looking at the intensity of the use. 
Um, so we quite often will receive an operational letter from an applicant um, and, and use that uh, to determine whether or not uh, the parking demand is really commensurate with the land use. So uh, we do have that ability, uh, which we exercise quite frequently on behalf um, of our engineering department. Um, as far as looking at them um, moving forward, I understand uh, engineering will be bringing um, amendments to the parking bylaw forward um, in, in 2022, um, where we anticipate seeing some significant benefits uh, to small business. Uh, I don't have the specific uh, details of what that will look like, um, but we anticipate seeing some improvement there, an opportunity to um, to apply the parking bylaw differently in terms of minimums and maximums for commercial uses. Okay, and my last question is, this is really exciting in the sense that this is gonna make a huge difference for new businesses coming in. How how do you consult with our business community in developing these changes, recognizing that they are going to make a significant impact to our small business sector? Yeah, so we, um, since 2017, we've been working really closely with the BIAs. Um, when we um, first rolled out our commercial renovation center, which started out quite small, um, we're looking to build on that um, uh, in the coming months. But yeah, it's the, the BIAs have sort of been that um, that main uh, focal point for us in terms of engagement. We also have uh, many frequent flyers who do business in the city of Vancouver, uh, specific to commercial um, tenant improvements. So we work closely with with them as well. Um, in in terms of how, where we're getting these initiatives, you know, a lot of that is coming from um, industry. Uh, who are interested in, in supporting uh, the improvements that we're making. So we do have a lot of, um, not necessarily ongoing engagement, but we do get a lot of feedback, which we have used then to drive these initiatives forward. And recognizing that they're complex in the um, updates here, is there an ability to promote the commercial renovation center, or update it to better move businesses through this process? Yeah, and that's that's a great question, and thank you. Um, one thing we have noticed, and 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 in speaking with counselors, um, getting that feedback as well, is is we need to be uh, more visible. Uh, we need to promote the commercial renovation center more broadly. Um, so that's work that we're doing behind the scenes. Uh, we have brought in uh, one additional resource to support that work, um, but yes, we we recognize there's more to be done there. Perfect. Thank you so much. See no one else in the queue, I'm happy to move the report. Actually, you're, you're a little ahead of the game, Councillor Weave, because we do have speakers, and we do have to do a call for speakers, so um, hold, just hold, hold, hold on that one. Um, okay, um, are there any other questions to staff at this point? Nope, okay. So we will now hear from the public, and I'll remind um, the public again to call 1-833-353-8610 followed by participant code 88437 pound before close of the list um, and, and made available on the live stream as well as Twitter. Um, we do have one registered speaker tonight and do we have the speaker on the line clerk? We do, okay. Uh, speaker number one, Yunish Sharma, are you on the line? Hello, yes. Hi, good evening. Um, Go ahead, you have five minutes to speak to Council. Great, thanks. Hello, Council and staff. My name is Manish Sharma, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Communications with the Building Owners and Managers Association of British Columbia, BOMA, BC. On behalf of our Board of Directors, thank you for allowing us to present. We are delighted to speak in favor of the recommended changes tabled today, as we believe they will help our members assist more of their tenants to open and reopen their small businesses. As you may have already seen, according to a 2020 study by Local BC, an organization who speaks for Business Improvement Area Association and other representatives, it found that the average economic loss per business permit or license delay in the city of Vancouver is over $700,000. This includes costs to businesses, including lost revenues and leasing costs, and broader economic losses related to lost employment and supplier sales. But it is a staggering number by any count. At the time of the study, the average wait for permits licenses in the city was 8.2 months, and it showed that each week of wait time that can be eliminated 
can reduce the average loss per permit or license by $31,000. As a member of the Urban Design Panel and the Mayor's Green City and Renewable City 2050 Advisory Group for the past six years, I have seen the effects that permitting approval delays can have on development and renovation projects in Vancouver. And as an employee of BOMA BC, we have been working closely with staff over the past number of years to help provide recommendations that could significantly help improve the city's permitting system. So we encouraged by council and staff's willingness to try these new and innovative ideas. And we appreciate that they have continued to listen to our members' concerns. Removing the upgrade trigger for demising wall alterations, the proposed change of use amendments, relaxing the amount of people allowed to define a small suite and increasing the threshold for parking requirements from 200 to 300 meters squared will provide the flexibility required to, for landlords and small businesses to make necessary renovations to keep their businesses thriving. Additionally, as a result of COVID-19 pandemic and related public health orders, we expect more businesses to be making adjustments to their total floor area requirements when they reopen. So we believe that these recommendations will help clear the backlog of delayed permits and further support efforts to get more businesses open and reopened as we recover from the economic impacts of the pandemic. One more thing that would be helpful to our industry is if you can make these changes immediately, as there are many projects on the go or in the works that would benefit from these changes right now. Again, we appreciate Council's determination to help us resolve some of our permitting and licensing issues in the city, and we can commit to continuing to work with you and staff to get the job done, so to speak. Thank you for taking the time to hear our thoughts, and if I can provide any more information, please do not hesitate to ask. Sincerely, Manish Sharma, on behalf of the Building Owners and Managers Association of British Columbia, or BOMA BC. Thanks. Great, thanks, Manish. You do have questions from a couple of councillors. Councillor Weeb, I have you on the queue. Is that for questions, correct? Or is that a holdover? That's a holdover. Okay, thanks. Uh, I will advance myself to ask a question. Um, Manish, the question that I have for you, and you referenced change of use, I heard I heard that consistently um, from a lot of um, applicants. Do you feel that that was, that was sort of one of the more significant hurdles in terms of the time delays, either um, waiting for a change of use um, or the upgrades that were triggered? Do you think that's one of the more significant changes that can be made? Was that something that you heard? Yeah, we've been hearing the same. Actually, they all are suggestions that we support and we all think they're gonna be uh, valuable. And and I think, yeah, you're right. It, it put an unnecessary delay onto, onto things that, that really didn't need to be there, uh, especially for small projects like, like changes like, like that. And um, if it's not a significant change of use, it's better for us to try and get the businesses open so we can you know, not affect the, the timing of the lease or, or how many people can be employed or what kind of services are being able to be offered in, the, in that community. So I think it's great. Okay, so I just wanted, I was just curious it, it sort of with your perspective on the magnitude of the problem because it was something that I've heard about that's come up a number of times. Yeah, we are hearing it a lot. We've also heard a lot about the demising wall recently too, and uh, we we expect that in the wake of the reopening of businesses after the COVID-19 to the new normal, we're really going to see a lot more projects come through with that. And we really appreciate the fact that they that that council is willing to not put them through the longer process because it's just going to delay the economy that much further. Great. Thank you for uh, for speaking to council. And you don't have any further questions. Have a great night. Thank you very much. Okay, Clerk, do we have any other speakers on the line at this point? I'm just double checking and I'm getting an answer of none on the line and none in person. Okay, so I'm gonna proceed with the three final calls then. Um, so commencing my first, uh, first final call for speakers, if there are any additional ones for this item that wish to speak to council, they could call toll free at 1-833-353-8610 followed by participant code 884 three seven pound before close of the speaker's list. The phone number has been tweeted out at Van City Clerk and made available on the live stream. And as noted, we do not see any speakers pre present in council chamber. That is my first call. Second call, uh, speakers prior to close of the list, um, which is imminent, uh, should call one 353 8610 followed by participant code 884-37-POUND. Um, and again, that number can be found either on the live stream or on Twitter at Van City Clerk. And third and final call for the call-in number 1833-353-8610, followed by participant code 884-37-POUND. Um, 
Last call, phone number has been tweeted out and made available in the live stream and there are no speakers that appear to be present at council. I'm just double checking, Chair. And no, we're not seeing any additional speakers at this time. Okay, do clerks recommend that we need to take five minutes in between or do you feel we can proceed here? That has been the practice. Okay, uh, we will take a five minute recess and reconvene at 9.44 p.m., thank you.
There's my mic back again. Um, thank you, staff. Um, can we are back. Can you confirm that there are no more speakers at this point? No speakers. Okay. Seeing there are no additional speakers, the speakers list is now closed. And seeing uh, as few or no public comments were received on this item after 5 p.m. today, I suggest we now close receipt of public comments and move on to hearing closing comments, asking any further questions of staff and to make a decision. Um, any closing comments from staff? Thank you for the opportunity to speak. No closing comments. Thank you. Any questions from council? Okay, this would be a time to make a motion to move the recommendation. Move the recommendations. Moved by Councillor Hardwick, seconded by Councillor Weeb. Councillor Weeb. Uh, I'll ask the clerk to take us to a vote, please. Councillor Diginova, I don't have you voting. Do you need a vote assist? Clerk, do we have Councillor Diginova present for the vote? So if, a count, if we are in a voting process, we do have to suspend the vote if a councillor might be having technical difficulties. So we'll just try to reach Councillor to Genova. Can you hear me now? We I can. can't turn my video on. I'm sorry, I lost connection and my computer tried to reboot. So uh, may I? I, I have been present and I've been trying to talk, but my computer shut down WebEx. So may I vote? Yes, and ask would you, for a vote assist. Would you like a vote assist in? In favor, please. In favor? Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Okay, that has passed with none in opposition. And I would, uh, that concludes item four. And I would very much welcome a motion to adjourn. Motion so to adjourn. Second. second. So moved by Councillor Hardwick, seconded by Councillor DiGenova. Any opposition? Nope. And this public hearing of October 14th is adjourned. Good night, everybody, and good night, Council. Good work, Chair. Good night, good night everyone. Good Great job, good Chair. Night. Good Thanks. job. Yeah, good Thanks. job. Thank you, staff.